Okay, so, if you spend a good amount of time online, there's a good chance you've seen this image. The dark lighting, the uninterested expressions on the kids' faces, the all-encompassing fuzzy glow, and the painfully enthusiastic expression on the face of... Well, what is it exactly? Paired with the concerning double entendre of Dick the birthday boy, this image is just so... odd. But what if I told you that this character right here was not only beloved by children during his time, but also staunchly heterosexual? I ain't gay, but I never kissed a girl. If I find the right one, I hope to give it a whirl. And this is Billy Bob, one of the many members of the Rock of Fire Explosion, an animatronic band that... Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start from the beginning. Act 1. So, like, animatronics, right? You know Chuck E. Cheese, right? Everyone's been to Chuck E. Cheese a few times before in their childhood. Except for my friend who was told as a kid that you weren't allowed in unless it was someone's birthday. But, like, everyone knows what Chuck E. Cheese is. It's an arcade mostly geared towards kids where you can eat pizza, and oh yeah, they've also got those weird robots that the kids either tend to ignore or try to climb on stage with to break. These guys are important, or rather their earliest forms are, for us to understand how we get to the Rock of Fire explosion. The year is 1972, and a hot new game from the newest name of technology, Atari, is sweeping the nation. It's called Pong, maybe you've heard of it. The founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, was getting into creating arcade games after having gone to the University of Utah for electrical engineering. He was inspired by the actual first video game ever, Space War, and the arcade and the theme park he worked at during the summers. The success of Pong pretty much kickstarted the arcade industry, and while Bushnell was making plenty of money off selling arcade machines to arcades, it didn't take long for him to realize he could be making a lot more money if he opened an arcade chain himself to operate the machines out of. There were a few things Bushnell combined to make the formula for the perfect arcade. He decided to combine the games with a meal as a way to set himself apart from similar places at the time, choosing pizza as he considered it a food most people enjoyed that was easy to quote, not screw up. He also found that there was a demand for live entertainment along with people's food at the time, and a visit to Disneyland made him realize that an animatronic show would be the perfect way to entertain guests at his restaurant. Bushnell had actually applied to become an Imagineer at Disney after graduating from college, but was repeatedly denied since Disney tends not to hire recent graduates. While he got the idea for animatronic entertainment from the Enchanted Tiki Room, he would continue to further be inspired by Disney. He took the style of humor from the Country Bear Jamboree, as it could appeal to both adults and kids, and he was inspired by Mickey Mouse himself to market his arcade around a recognizable mascot. Despite Mickey and Chucky both being mice, Bushnell actually originally planned to make his mascot a coyote, and name his restaurant Coyote Pizza. But when the coyote mascot head he'd ordered arrived, he realized it was actually a rat head. He decided to roll with it, at first rebranding to Ricky Rat's Pizza Time Theater, until Atari's PR team told him it's probably not the best idea to have your restaurant associated with a rat. So they again changed the name, this time to the Big Cheese's Pizza Time Theater. This also didn't work out because apparently the Marriott Hotel had a trademark for the phrase the Big Cheese? So the name was changed again, along with the name of the mascot. He became known as Chuck E. Cheese, a name you can't say without smiling. Because we wanted to smile, Chuck E. Chuck e. Cheese. We wanted to smile. We, we wanted this name so that you couldn't say it without smiling. And the restaurant became known as Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater. The very first Pizza Time Theater location opened on May 17, 1977 in San Jose, California. The show featured Chuck E. himself along with several other characters known as the Pizza Time Players, Helen Henney, Jasper T. Giles, Pasquale P. Pie Plate, and Krusty the Cat. Krusty would later be replaced with Mr. Munch in 1978 at their second location. The gang performed as half-body animatronics sitting inside picture frames hung 360 degrees around the dining area. The first locations were a huge hit with families and Nolan began to set his sights on expansion. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, a young inventor named Aaron Fector had begun to build some of his first animatronics. Aaron Fector was born December 21, 1953 in Orlando, Florida, making him 69 years old today. Nice. He graduated from college at the age of 19 and decided to become an inventor. At the time, the United States was in the middle of an energy crisis, and Aaron dedicated himself to creating a new, more fuel-efficient type of car. He built a prototype of this car called the Jetta, and this is one of the silliest damn things I've ever seen. I love it so much. Side note, while I was trying to find the name of the car, I googled creative engineering car and just found a different company also named Creative Engineering that makes car parts. I feel like I found an alternate universe where this worked out for Aaron and he never got around to making animatronics, but anyway. Aaron founded the company Creative Engineering Inc, or CEI for short, for the Jetta, and began to accrue funding for his project. In order to do that, he became a door-to-door -door salesman selling other inventions he made, like the Leaf Eater, a contraption you'd put in your pool and it would collect all the leaves, which is an extremely Floridian problem. 
One day, he knocked on the door of someone who asked for his help on a different project, designing an electronic control system made for a shooting gallery, made to sell to amusement parks. Gave him, and my spiel always started out, Hi, I'm Aaron Fector, and I'm an inventor, and I've invented this leaf eater, and it cleans your swimming pool. And he looked at me kind of sarcastically, and he said, So, you're an inventor, huh? I said, Yes. Well, he says, Well, an inventor can invent anything. I said, Yes, I can invent anything. And so he says, Well, could you invent a control system to, to control a shooting gallery? for an amusement park. I said, sure. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but I figured I could do it. I had an electronics background, and uh, that's how I got into entertainment, because um, I built the shooting gallery. His company was building a talking horse, and I loved it. It was a little animatronic talking horse. I started getting all these invitations to build talking bears and talking monsters of various sorts. And uh, before you know it, I was building a whole shows. Tangent one, Aaron's silly little guys. I know I said this video would be about the rocket fire explosion, but I think it's time to go through some of Aaron's animatronics leading up to them. Partly because some of them have direct lineage to the rocket fire characters, and partly because I just think it would be fun. Willy Wabbit, a talking wabbit, <laughs> a talking rabbit built in 1976. He sat at a kiosk in the Orlando airport to advertise the tourist attraction Mystery Funhouse and generally attract new customers. Aaron had the idea to use animated characters for advertising purposes, and Willie is the first to do so, and with no limit to his vocabulary. He's got a computer inside. The computer selects from various numbers of messages which he is capable of producing, and so it's pretty random. You never know what he's going to say next. Friendly Freddy. Built in 1977, he was CEI's first fully animated character. Commissioned by Jim Sidwell Sr., he was first seen at the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, or IAAPA, promoting creative engineering and their other characters. Freddy would go on to perform at Sidwell's theme park, Magic World Kids Park, in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Friendly Freddy would later go on to be retrofitted into General Cornelius Bear Patch, one of three members of the Confederate Critters Band. Mm. Actually, I'd just like to read what the Showbiz Pizza Wiki says about the Confederate Critters Band because maybe you'll have the same reaction I did when I first read this. The Confederate Critters Show is an early animatronic band created by Aaron Fector in 1977 for Jim Sidwell Sr., owner of the Magic World Kids Park in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. The band was a one-stage show designed to look like the inside of a giant tree stump. The band consisted of three characters, Major Mosby Greyhound III on piano, General Cornelius Bearpatch on guitar, and Colonel Stonewall J. Fox on banjo. All these characters were dressed as Confederate soldiers. Stonewall J. Fox and Major Mosby were voiced by John Cedarberg. The show also featured a live cast member before portraying a Union officer named Ulysses S. Smith who would perform alongside the show. After conversing with characters, would bring around a bottle of moonshine for the audience to smell and sobbing during Mosby's number about lost love. The show invites entirely what? Oh, the show in its entire- it's written as the show invites entirety. It was sold at auction with Magic World's closing in 1996, and was sold by Sonny Thrower, Magic World GM, to Charles Moore, the owner of a business named Celebrity Golf. The characters are put on display after being retrofitted into bears, but were in such bad shape at the time that the show was destroyed indefinitely with Celebrity Golf's closure in 1997, which later on turned into what's now Ripley's Haunted Attractions. Good gosh. Oh god, my Google Doc reloaded. Oh shit. Oh fuck. Cut all this out. Ah! The Bear Country Jubilee, which is definitely not a ripoff of Disney's Country Bear Jamboree, was built between 1977 and 1978. From left to right, their names are Pierre, Waldo, Fingers Dan, Fingers Dan, Chet Fadigans, Buddy Crash, Boom Boom Bosco, and Beatrice. The show was originally very limited in movement, but was updated with new characters and movements to become the Country Bear Jubilee instead of the Bear Country Jubilee. The Country Bear Jubilee, created in 1979, was the successor to the Bear Country Jubilee. The characters consisted of- ah, oh, really? Okay. The characters consisted of Billy Wilbur, Billy Bill, Billy Boy, Billy Bob, Choo Choo, Pete and Reet Pete Thornsberry, Mama Graham Bags, and Goonie Bird. Note that this band has a character named Billy Bob. This is not the direct predecessor to the Rockefeller's Billy Bob, at least not in appearance. He was instead directly based on Billy Wilbur, and Goonie Bird would go on to become the Rockefeller's Looney Bird. Pete and Reet Pete worked at Smitty's Super Service Station, which would later become the set piece behind Billy Bob and Looney Bird in the Rockefeller. Choo Choo of the Hard Luck Bears would continue to stay about the exact same in the Rock of Fire, and there's also a couple of what looks like an early version of Birthday Bird here. This show would later be renamed the Hard Luck Bears, after the name of the group of bears on center stage. God, that was tiring. I want to talk about the Wolfpack 5 now. 
The Wolf Pack 5 is the final full animatronic show that creative engineering made before creating the Rock of Fire explosion. Built in 1979, the band consisted of five members, Fast Gorilla, Dingo Star, Beach Bear, Little Queenie, and of course, the Wolfman. The Wolfman, a parody of radio DJ Wolfman Jack, was the leader and would introduce the show and other members' solos. Fats played the piano and was loosely based on Fats Domino, an American pianist and songwriter popular in the 50s. Dingo Starr was the dog on the drums and an obvious parody of Ringo Starr of the Beatles. Beach Bear was an oxymoronic polar bear playing guitar and doesn't seem to be a parody of anyone in particular. And finally, Queenie was a sole female vocalist of the group, also seemingly being a fully original character. Being the direct predecessor to the Rock of Fire, basically every character here can be pretty obviously tied in appearance and or role to their Rock of Fire counterpart. Wolfman to Rolf, Dingo to Duke, Fats to Fats, Beach Bear to Beach Bear. It gets more obvious as you go. Queenie is Mitzi's predecessor, but that's not entirely clear from this version of her. Queenie was later changed to a mouse character, as it was thought that this would be more family friendly. This version of her was named Mini Mozzarella, which has a much closer resemblance both in appearance and name to the Rock of Fire's Mitzi Mozzarella. Re-enter Nolan Bushnell, about two years back. He's visiting the IAAPA that year as he was in the progress of making his Pizza Time Theater come to fruition, and he runs into Aaron showcasing his animatronics. Nolan is impressed with his work and offers Aaron a job in making the animatronics for PTT. Aaron politely declines, afraid that Atari would reverse engineer his animatronics and put him out of a job soon after. This paranoia is something we'll see return a lot in Aaron, so put a pin in this. The two go their separate ways until the following IAAPA, when Nolan reapproaches after seeing the Wolfpack 5 showcased. This time, he offers not only to buy his animatronics, but to buy creative engineering as a whole. Aaron declines again, and the matter is seemingly dropped. Time passes, Pizza Time Theater is opened, and things are going just well for Nolan Bushnell. He's ready to expand, with the goal of opening a thousand PTTs nationwide by the end of the decade. He plans to do this with the help of a man named Robert Brock, or just Bob Brock. Bob was the president of Topeka Inn Management, at the time the largest franchisee of Holiday Inn Hotel, so he had plenty of experience in franchising locations. He's perfect for the job of franchising Chuck E. Cheese. Nolan plans to have Bob opening his first location in Kansas City, Missouri in 1979. But Bob is one concern with the chain, and that's the animatronics. He had expressed some dissatisfaction with how they looked in the past, and while Nolan had assured him that they would drastically increase in quality by the time of Bob's first location opening, this hadn't been the case. Nolan had also in the past mentioned creative engineering, but seemingly downplayed the quality of their animatronics. With Bob's first location only months away from opening, he gets curious about creative engineering and decides to take a trip to Florida to see these animatronics himself. Upon Bob's arrival, Aaron gives him a full tour of the warehouse, and Bob is blown away by the quality of the animatronics. So much so that he decides he wants to continue his future in animatronic dining with Aaron instead of Nolan Bushnell. They plan to call this new chain Showbiz Pizza Place. He calls Nolan, demanding out of his contract so he can open his own pizza place, to which Nolan obviously says, No, what the fuck, I'm not letting you do that. Bob takes this projection like a rational, level-headed adult human being. Nah, I'm totally kidding, he opened Showbiz anyway without permission. The first show was actually opened in that same location Bob was supposed to open his first piece of time theater. Because it was slated to open within the next few months by the time the plans had changed, Bob and Aaron decided to go with whatever animatronic creative engineering had ready at the moment, which happened to be the Wolfpack 5. See, that tantrum wasn't for nothing. Obviously this doesn't make Nolan happy, and it's not long before Bob Brock is hit with a lawsuit. Not from Nolan Bushnell, but from Chuck E. Cheese, the company? The lawsuit's on grounds of breach of contract and, quote, theft of trade secrets, which, holy shit. In response to this, Chuck E. Cheese, the company, has a countersuit filed against them, not by Robert Brock or Aaron Fector, but from Showbiz Pizza, the company, claiming misrepresentation. This was the true start of the pizza wars. The Showbiz showdown. The animatronic aggression. The Chuck E. Cheese conflict. The pizza time tussle. The robot wrestle. The this was a battle for the ages at the time. This was this generation's Nintendo vs. Sega. While the lawsuit was going on, both chains began a race to expand faster and better than the other. Locations began spreading across the country like wildfire. If you were here during this time or you know someone who was, they'll likely still be on either the side of Chuck E. Cheese or Showbiz. Speaking of Showbiz, at their first location, the Wolfpack 5 was a big hit among families, despite them having supposed to be the temporary band. Because of this, they based the next and permanent iteration of the Showbiz band heavily on that group. And what they came up with was the Rock of Fire Explosion. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's most advanced entertainment has now joined forces with the world's finest pizza. But what is the Rock of Fire explosion anyway? Well, Act 2. The Rock of Fire explosion's awesome, actually. 
Okay, before we start, I would like to formally apologize for the audio quality in Act 1. This is not scripted. I just figured this out. I have been... I, I have a fucking Blue Yeti microphone, and my audacity was not recording from the blue yeti microphone this entire time i recorded this act already i'm re-recording this act because it was recording from my logitech camera my webcam that i use for streaming i don't use the microphone on that ever because it's like a whole foot away from me and it won't pick up the audio quality good and i just thought my blue yeti sucked it's i'm sorry blue yeti i didn't mean it Anyway, let's start the actual. The Rock of Fire explosion consists of anywhere between 8 and 14 characters, depending on how you count them. Specifically, 8 major characters, 4 minor characters, and 2 prop characters. Simply because it would make me the happiest, we'll go through all of them. Billy Bob Broccoli, short for William Robert Broccoli, yes, that is his real name, was the mascot of Showbiz Pizza Place, though not necessarily the leader of the Rock of Fire. Instead, he was posted on stage left. Voiced by Aaron Factor, he sings, plays the guitar, and he'd often MC for the others and introduce songs, but he also often had songs with the band or of his own. Billy Bob is from Tennessee, is apparently four oh, years old as of 1984, making him 43 as of 2023. He likes music, baseball, gummy bears, and his friends. He's one of the more conflict-avoiding characters in the group, and I read him as the kind of guy to lower his voice to a whisper before saying something just slightly mean and still feeling bad. Billy Bob runs a gas station called Smitty's Super Service Station with the sidekick Looney Bird, also voiced by Aaron, a drunkard bird that lives in an oil drum and drinks Goofy Gas. Goofy Gas, invented by Looney and Billy Bob, is a drinkable, environmentally friendly alternative to gasoline, made from moonshine, or corn squeezins as they call it. That right, Looney Bird. That's right, Billy Bob! And I got the refreshments in my barrel! Now, I don't believe corn squeezins goes too good with pizza, Looney Bird. Well... Around halfway through the Rock of Fire's lifespan, Looney Bird received a new personality trait in the form of becoming very technologically savvy. He began to invent several new gadgets that play a role both in show tapes and the real world, like a Santa tracker during a Christmas show tape, the real-life show selector where kids could press a button to activate a certain show segment to play, and he even aspired to create a programming language accessible to kids. Looney Bird had also had his own recurring segments called Letters to Looney Bird. An in-depth look at characters, places, and even some other characters! This would feature questions from children to the members of the Rock of Fire, and gives us some fun trivia about the characters. Fats Geronimo, voiced by Burt Wilson, is inarguably the frontman of the Rock of Fire explosion. He's portrayed as an older character and a bit of a father figure to the rest of the band. He most often plays the straight man in skits, though he does have a bit of a funny bone of his own. Fats plays the tune machine, a keyboard slash synthesizer kind of thing that can supposedly make any sound in the entire world. He has a bit of an inflated sense of ego. He's intelligent. Articulate? Charismatic? Oh, you just saying that because it's true. No, really. He also has a steady girlfriend named Esmeralda, who's mentioned many times, but we never meet or hear in much more description than her name. Mitzi Mozzarella, voiced at first by Aaron and then by Shalissa James, is the youngest member of the Rock of Fire Explosion. She doesn't play an instrument, but provides the band with her unique female vocals. Mitzi is a teenage girl who likes boys, cars, and cheerleading. She has a bubbly personality with a tendency to become obsessive. Well, he must have you saw Michael Jackson? Yeah, and we did Billie Jean. The Michael Jackson? <laughs> the Michael Jackson, it was so great, and he did some songs no, from his album Thriller. No, you couldn't have done that to me! You mean you saw him and I didn't get to? No, well, well, maybe another time, but it was I so much fun. I'll never get to see him again, and y'all got to see him! Well, it's not fair! Well, Michael Jackson's my favorite thing, I love him! Mitzi is also the only character not just to have a canon aged birthday, but to actually age as the band does. Her voice actress was only 11 years old when she joined the band. Mitzi's 17th birthday was celebrated at the stroke of midnight on January 1st, 1988. So depending on how you consider the canon to work, I would either make her 52 years old as of 2023, or 17 for the 35th year in a row. Wait, older than Billy Bob? Beach Bear, originally voiced by Aaron and then by Rick Bailey, is the designated cool guy of the Rock of Fire Explosion. He's a polar bear that vastly prefers the sun and surf, so much so that as a kid I literally did not register he was supposed to be a bear. I only saw the Rock of Fire like twice ever in my entire childhood, I did not know what his name was, cut me some slack. Beach Bear is the eloquent one of the group and is most likely to use big words. Anything. Uh, how about a uh, 19 apathetic old men with a marked propensity toward procrastination and sloth. Well, ridiculously decorated, perforated, somehow understated, insulated, acceptable colanders bought somewhere off the coast of Phoenix, Arizona. How's that? 
but I'm not sure how much of those big words he actually knows the meaning to. You know, I thought I think it sets precedence for a contemporary musical demographics. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I think it has sort of an anti-pseudo expressionism in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's that mean? Uh, it means it's it's now. It's wow. He plays lead guitar for the band and in my opinion has one of the best voices in the entire group. Take a look. Duke LaRue, voiced by Duke Chappetta, is the Rockefeller's drummer. He's a dog of indeterminate breed with a passion for outer space and a few missing brain cells. Duke has a tendency to trip over his words, miss social cues, speak bluntly, and have the joke fly over his head. Unfortunately, because he was made in the 80s, this makes him the stupid character instead of the autistic one. Duke is my favorite Rock of Fire character tied with Looney Bird, partly for his personality and partly for his absolutely gorgeous voice. I thought love was only true fairy tales Meant for someone else but not for me It's my girl My girl Rolf the Wolf, voiced by Aaron Fector, takes stage right, and it's considered more of a side act for the show. Rolf himself rarely ever sings and never has a song to himself. He's usually part of the ensemble or there to add comedic excites. He's usually part of the ensemble or there to add comedic excites. Rolf himself rarely ever sings and never. He's usually part of the ensemble or there to add comedic excites. What the? F Rolf himself rarely ever sings and never has a song to himself. He's usually part of the ensemble or there to add comedic excites to whatever segment they're doing. He's very self-centered and has a hugely inflated ego. He talks about himself as if he's a huge celebrity comedian, or at least well on his way to becoming one, when in reality he's not very good at what he does and most of the Rock of Fire hates him. Whether or not this is a cover for deeper insecurity remains to be seen, though he does always sort of talk like he's about to cry. And I don't need you anymore. Like Billy Bob and Fats, Rolf often introduces show segments along with his little buddy Earl, the puppet on his hand. Earl Schmerl, also voiced by Aaron, is a ventriloquist puppet. Ventriloquist, and you're supposed to be a dummy. <laughs> and the second half of Rolf's act. Together they form the Rolf and Earl Show, a two-man Monzai comedy act. Earl, while being a puppet, is strongly implied to be sentient in his own person, though they keep this vague enough that you could really theorize it in either direction. Hey, watch this, everyone. Earl, why don't you tell everybody here just how long you've been in show business? Oh, come on, Earl. Tell everybody how you've been in show business. <laughs> Earl, come on, man. Earl, I'm waiting. <laughs> While Rolf is selfish behind a proper and friendly exterior, Earl is the exact opposite. He's always yelling, picking on Rolf, or just generally being mad at something or someone. Hey, let's get on with the show, what do you say, Earl? <laughs> You're a geek. That's my man, Earl. I can't even stand to look at you. Yeah, thanks for the compliment, Earl, you too. <laughs> but deep down, he's a good person, and even cares about Rolf a little bit. You was just joking about leaving me. Once you're off, don't worry, Earl. I'll keep you on hand for a while longer. <laughs> All right. 
Despite being a gag character, Earl actually also sings solo quite often, and I think he's got an impressive voice at that too. The rest of the characters here are much more minor, so I'll be going a lot faster through them now. In the back of center stage behind some stage setting exists the sun and the moon. They're for the most part prop characters, but they often join in songs as part of the ensemble, and have actually spoken in shows before. The moon is a big stickler for the rules, and like copyright specifically, whereas the sun is also fairly reserved, but is more likely to indulge in some gentle rule breaking for the sake of fun. I have you know that it's against the copyright laws to tamper with the original text. Why this place can be raided by police officers at any moment. No, 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 no. I will stick with the original masterpiece. Thank you very much. One moment, Moon. I think that is a valid point. I think I'll try it. Walk on the wild side. Listen, crazy different, crazy different. Oh, I've got it. Seven turtleneck sweaters. I want you. Antioch the Spider is a spider. Named after the Antioch Shopping Center, where the first show of his pizza location opened, he wears a silly little party hat and talks exclusively in this weird fucked up gibberish. He's stored above the stage and comes down pretty rarely. We know he's fast as pet spider, but Antioch seems to have much higher intelligence than that of an average pet. In one segment, he was even fat as Olympic coach. Excuse me, folks, let me, allow me to introduce my training coach, Coach Antioch here, who just happens to be the most in-shape creature on the face of the earth. He's my coach. Choo Choo is the world's cutest bear. Situated in front of Duke's drum set, he has never spoken, he does not sing, he has never added anything to any show tape whatsoever. All he can do is bounce up and down in time to the music, but by god, isn't that enough? He's a baby. He's a little boy. He's doing his best, and I love him. Well, there's Choo Choo! Choo Choo! Oh, Did y'all forget about Choo Choo? Choo Choo! Yeah, I forgot about him. Yeah, what? Birthday Bird is a little bird that sits on top of Billy Bob's guitar. This one's literally just a prop, an accessory even, but I still love him. I don't think the rest of the community sees it this way, but I consider owning a complete birthday bird to be one of the highest honors an animatronic lover could have. <coughs> this is a frog. I think his name is just Frog. Wait, does the frog have a gender? In a lot of stages, you'll find the frog on the floor in front of Beach Bear or just on the floor in some other random place, but it originally sat on Beach Bear's surfboard in between his legs. There's one video on Air Infector's YouTube channel where for some reason Beach Bear is naked and the only thing shielding us and all the children from seeing his junk is that frog, smugly sitting there with the knowledge of what it looks like. Godspeed, soldier. And that's all the characters from Shoba's Pizza. There aren't any others. Th there aren't... There aren't any others. The thing about the rock fire explosion that I find is that they're very hard to explain the appeal of, at least just verbally. When I try to explain it to my friends, I find it easiest to just send them videos to look at, because just showing images can make them come off as creepy looking, or just talking about them makes them seem bland. I think their charm comes off the most not just when they're in action, but when they're a unit. They have the dynamic of a very tight-knit found family. They're constantly teasing each other, but you can always tell they care very much about each other, and when it's made transparent, it's even more tangible. The voice actors were all very close in real life, and I believe many of their skits were at least partially improv, and I honestly believe this is to the huge benefits of the characters and the charm of the band. They're best friends, they're a family, they love each other. But like I've said, I don't think any amount of my words could properly convey that as much as I believe just showing you could. So here's a handful of clips that I think well convey what I love about them so much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to sing a song. Uh -huh. uh, does the song have a name? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, everybody here has got Spirit of Christmas. Well, I don't. Well, let's get on with the show anyway. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, that's horseback riding! Yeah. Oh, last summer we used to always go horseback riding at Camp Behima Hama Jima Bama Wima Wama Kima <laughs> There's nothing about any nightclub in this song. The big bear quit laughing. Now, now, now look, baby. And if it's okay with Looney Bird, I'm going to invite you to sing the song for us. I don't care. I'm leaving. It, um, it's about this gorilla, and he's he goes in a spaceship, and he yeah. goes to the moon, and... You freaking out again? <laughs> uh, forget about the introduction. I'll do it. Well, excuse me, Joe Intro. I guess you know everything. If you know so much, why don't you just just run for president of the world? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Really snappy retort. But a ten for me. What's that? Two threes or four? 
Beach Bear, I'll meet more ladies by accident than you will ever meet on purpose. Yeah. That's medley of songs for us. Ain't that right there, Dookie? That's right, Pats. I'm going to mm-hmm. sing a song by... Uh, 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 what you gonna sing, Duke? Go well, on, go ahead, spit it I'm out. I'm gonna sing a medley, medley of songs, and one of them is called <laughs> Abracadabra by Steve Miller, and the other one is uh, You Can Do Magic by America. Oh, I bet that's gonna hey, turn out fine. How come you gonna sing both that songs? That is not fair. Well, the magic show was my idea. So what? Who cares? Well, the boss said I could. Now, do I need any more reason than that? Welcome to the cutthroat world of fast food entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. I love this kind of music. It reminds me of the early 60s, like Ooh, where we are right now. Me too. Right here. Yeah. Makes me think of tie-dye. Makes me think of idealistic, romantic notions that the world could change just because we had a wonderful leader who believed in it. Makes me think of tie-dye. Yeah, John Kennedy. That's right. John Kennedy. Beach Bear, you weren't even listening to that. No, I was. It makes <laughs> me think of tie-dye. Duke yeah. wants to ask a question before he plays his song. Go ahead. Okay. Who made the 19... Uh... Who made the night? Uh, no wait. Who made the first nineteen uh, twenty-three uh, Henway? What's a Henway? About three pounds. <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> okay, let's hear it for the big old fat monkey. <laughs> I'm gonna break your neck, bro. Wonderful idea there, Mitzi. What? What? <laughs> People like Michael Jackson. They get accosted for autographs all the time. Now he was out at Disney World trying to have a good time. If you had been there trying to get 400 autographs, you would have ruined his day. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Good. Now, what are you going to do if you see Michael Jackson? Okay. I'm going to rip his shirt off. I'm going to get caught in his hair. I'm going to take off his shoes. I'll do anything just to make up for this time when I didn't get his autograph. Yeah. All right. I can understand that. been practicing. Watch this. Ooh. That ain't nothing. Hi, welcome back. How do you feel? Uh, do, do you get it now? You get it? I think we get it. All right, we can move on? Great, perfect. Now, I think I'd be remiss in talking about the appeal of the Rock of Fire if I didn't talk about some of their most famous bits and skits. So here's some that my friends and I consider quintessential. The Abbey Road medley is known for being perhaps one of the most famous Rock of Fire explosion segments out there. It's a nearly 15 minute long medley of nine songs from, of course, the Beatles' Abbey Road. I am by no means a Beatles fan, if anything I think it's funny to be a Beatles hater, but even I can admit I deeply love this medley. It hits on so many emotions, it's near cinematic at times, and now I have to admit that I can easily recognize several Beatles songs. Does this make me a Beatles fan now? Damn it. You win this time, Billy Bob. Heartaches, originally sung by Al Boley, was covered by Duke in the Rock of Fire's first ever show tape. It's a very well-known tune by the Rock of Fire community, and if you were on the internet around spring of 2021, you'll also know it from the song It's Just a Burning Memory off the Caretaker's album Everywhere at the End of Time. I, like many others, was pretty creeped out by the album, but I had no clue that It's Just a Burning Memory was based on an existing song, so when I heard Heartaches for the first time, you can imagine the jump scare I gave myself. <laughs> The Satisfaction medley is less of a medley and more of a mashup between the Rolling Stones' Satisfaction and Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild. 
There's something I personally find almost addicting about this one. Whether it's how I didn't expect the two songs to fit together as well as they do, or how the whole band gets involved in this almost rotation near the end when they finally all come together, or just how fucking hyped up Looney Bird gets Billy Bob, I never get sick of hearing this one. Oh, yeah, it's also worth noting that this one comes after a segment where Looney Bird literally makes Billy Bob cry. It's one of the wildest things I've heard from this band, and I've heard a lot of wild things from this band. You know you're my best friend, Looney Bird. And I promise I'll never yell at you again if you'll talk to me, Looney Bird. <laughs> Please say you'll forgive me. I forgive you, Billy Bob. You do? Sure. You're my best friend! The Magic Night Show tape is not so much a single segment or cover that the Rock of Fire has done, but rather an entire hour-long show tape. This is widely regarded by fans as the band's best show. The show itself is from one of showbiz's semi-frequent themed nights, this one of course being the Magic Night. Nearly every song they sing in this one is themed around magic, from their initial medley including songs like Magical Mystery Tour by the Beatles and Magic Carpet Ride by Steppenwolf, to Duke's cover of the near shockingly horny Abracadabra by the Steve Miller Band, to Beach Bear's rendition of Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic by the Police. And then they end it with the Michael Jackson medley for some reason. The Michael Jackson medley is obviously a medley of Michael Jackson music, and is another famous segment from the Rock of Fire. Fun fact, Michael Jackson actually visited Creative Engineering once. Here's a picture of him from that day. Weird. Anyway, as famous as the Rock of Fire is for their covers, they've also done a handful of original songs as well. Baseball is a silly little ditty sung by Billy Bob and Looney Bird from one of the Rock of Fire's earliest show tapes. It's mostly just about how they like to play games and goof off instead of doing their chores, but for some reason they keep going back to how much they like girls, which feels like a cope, but we'll get there. We like to go to movies with pretty women. We like to go bowling with fine young women. We like short dresses. Drag Strip in the Sky is technically a cover in the sense that the Rock of Fire wasn't the first to sing it, but it is a CEI original. The song was originally sung by Little Queenie of the Wolfpack 5. It's about Queenie's boyfriend Foxy, not that one, a drag racer who is challenged to a race, so ends up taking his life. This song actually has some interesting evolution to it, as when Queenie was retrofitted into Minnie, as well as when Mitzi was introduced, both characters sung their own versions of Drag Strip, though this time the lyrics were changed slightly, renaming their boyfriend to Mickey. Maybe that one. Louisiana, written by Burt Wilson, is a love letter to the state both he and his character Fats grew up in. This song became a popular one among fans and would later get featured in several compilation tapes. Fats would also later claim that his song became the Louisiana State song, but that quickly gets debunked. Louisiana, you won't believe it in the springtime. <laughs> Fats, that's a song you wrote. The bad is the best Fats, you've ever had, Fats. Hey, what? Hey, I don't, I don't think that's a state song, man. Well, it should be. <laughs> Sittin' Too Long is a more modern Rock of Fire song, written by Aaron Factor and recorded by Rick Bailey as Beach Bear in 2012. It's a fairly simple song about, like, basically just feeling like shit and wanting to exercise. I've heard that this isn't a very well-liked song in the fandom, but I think it's silly fun. Child of the Rock harkens back to 1982 in the Rock of Fire's Abbey Road show tape. Written by Duke Chapetta, it's simply about how despite what the world throws his way or takes from him, he'll always have rock and roll in his life. In 2005, Duke would go on to reveal that the song actually comes from a bit of a place of jealousy. At the time, all the Rock of Fire voices were aspiring stars, and Burt Wilson seemed to be taking up a large portion of the spotlight. This left Duke feeling a bit cheated and wrote the song in retaliation. There are a couple other original Rock of Fire songs, and a couple that I'm sure existing fans are probably waiting for me to mention. We'll get there later, I promise. In the meantime, there's one more integral part of Rock of Fire culture, and yes, I do feel strongly enough about this to call it culture, that I've yet to mention here. And that is the great, the noble, the historical American Colander. Some of you may think I'm sporting the latest in modern haberdashery design. Others may think I have a stupid spaghetti strainer on my head. This isn't just a spaghetti strainer. We think of it as the noble American colander. You consider the part the colander has played in American history. Yes, in 1492, everybody knows Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 
But what they don't know is he never would have made it if it hadn't been for the calendar-like design of his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Strena Maria. And everybody recognizes Davy Crockett and his famous coonskin calendar. And it was a proud day in American history when women won equal rights through the Women's Roughage Act of 1857. And uh, if I remember correctly, that's the, that's the law that gave women the right to wear their husband's colanders. Once upon a time, people thought the earth was flat. Then they found out it was round. But I'm here to testify. The Earth is actually two colanders super glued at the equator. Uh, well, may maybe maybe they use some extra thick mozzarella cheese, Johnny. I don't know what I look like—an information booth. Oh, uh, now listen up. It was Albert Einstein, the big daddy of relativity who said that the colander was as good a protection as you can get against nuclear fallout. And then, one awful day in December 1926, Mrs. Martha Dropbottom, in an unthinking moment, snatched the colander off of her husband Herbert's head and began draining her That's the day the colander, stripped of its pride and integrity, reduced to a common kitchen utensil, was shoved back on the shelves of mankind. Until now. Let's join together. Too much time has passed, America. Let's get that colander out and let's get it cranked up. Come on, everybody. We want you. We want you here at Showbiz Pizza Place on Wednesday night. Get that colander down from that shelf. Get that old thing decorated and get it up on your head. That's right. Decorate the colander. Year is 1983. Shova's Pizza Place has been struggling under the strain of economic pressures of the time for some time now. If the restaurant doesn't turn a profit soon, it could be the end for them. And that profit would come in the strangest form, a kitchen utensil. The colander head movement started as a simple in-joke between Aaron Fector and his friends where they'd wear decorated colanders like hats, but became a phenomenon in March of 1983 when it got a dedicated event at Shova's Pizza. The plan of creative engineering was to create a show tape all about the colander head movement and encourage customers to come in with their own decorated colanders. Customers were incentivized to do so by a range of different rewards, free tokens and free drinks. But if you came in on a Wednesday, you'd also be rewarded with a print of a Rockefeller character of your choice, wearing a colander, of course, and the ability to be indoctrinated into the colander head movement officially. Guests who came every week of the event would be able to collect every print available. The restaurants would also host a colander decoration contest. Guests who made their own colanders could have their photo taken and enter them for a prize. There was just one small problem with Creative Engineering's plan. Corporate showbiz would never let them do this. So, corporate showbiz just wouldn't have to know about it. CEI and his employees would film an hour-long video to send to every showbiz location in the hopes of getting them on board with the idea. This video was a fake telethon called the Save the Colander Telethon. It consists of the musicians and voice actors behind the Rock of Fire explosion performing covers of the songs the Rock of Fire was well known for at the time, with breaks to explain the importance of the colander head movement and why showbiz locations should join them. They'd even fake phone calls from the location saying they were on board. Ultimately, this plan worked, and the colander head show tape went on to become real. The show tape contains several segments about the colander head movement and why customers should join in, with Rolf being the group skeptic. 
The show tape ends with the history of the colander, and on Wednesdays, the colander had indoctrination segment. The band even came up with an original song about colanders to perform. For this show tape, the entire band was given a minor retrofit to have their own colanders as well across every participating location. Ultimately, the event was a hit with guests, and March of 1983 would be Showbiz's first month in over a year that turned a profit. If it was because of the colander head movement, though, remains up for debate, I suppose. And it was our first profitable month in over a year. But the execs of Showbiz, being who they were, did not credit me or us or the colander head movement with their profitable month. The execs said, we were going to have a profitable month anyway because of cyclical, the cyclical nature of the restaurant business. I said, you guys, you guys will never make it. it it's, it's not going to make it. Show business is going to make it because you can't see the forest for the trees. And that was, that was. So now hopefully having thoroughly explained why the rock fire is awesome and ideally getting you as excited about them as I am, I'm sure you're thinking, these guys are great. How come nobody knows what they are anymore? Like, what the heck happened? Act 3, The Desperation of Aaron Fector. The year is 1982. Showbiz Pizza Place and Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater have been feuding for several years at this point. That lawsuit I mentioned like 30 minutes ago, it's still going on and would only be settled out of court this year for $50 million. Showbiz and PTT have been engaged in a war to open better restaurants and more places and faster. Often a showbiz location and a PTT location would open up within the same town, forcing kids and their families to pick a sort of side to be on. Both chains seemed unstoppable, like neither were going to go anywhere anytime soon. I mean, good pizza backed by live entertainment and a huge selection of video games to play when you're done? It sounds awesome! Oh, yeah, the video game market crashed in 1983. Now, at the time, Chuck E. Cheese was experiencing what we call hubris. They also believed they were unstoppable, and had spent the last years acting on that belief with virtually no pushback. Locations were spreading faster than the common cold, advertisers could go basically unchecked with their spending, etc. But eventually, they began to outpace themselves. The demand for a Chuck E. Cheese began to be less than the supply. They'd oversaturated their own market, and when the game market crashed in 83, it served as a sort of final nail in the coffin. Over at Showbiz, they were also struggling under the new economic strain. Creative Engineering had had a new line of improved Rockafire animatronics they were working on, a Gen 2 of sorts. This included a Duke animatronic that would be able to turn at the torso and raise his arms to different levels in order to play the drums more accurately, and a Mitzi animatronic with more movement in her arms and hips, giving her more of an impression that she was dancing. Right now, she looks the same, okay, the face will stay the same, the voice will stay the same. But notice these new movements. She has a hip bend. Take a look at those arm movements, would you? Those arms come in front of her body. She is really going to be able to perform. Picture that character who is just going through some routine movements right there, singing Tomorrow or, or her part in Abbey Road. Because of their financial issues, funding on these characters slowed and they were eventually put on indefinite hold. As you can imagine, this development didn't fare so well for the two restaurants whose marketing partly relied on all the video games you could play there. And in the end, one of the two chains would end up filing for bankruptcy. And it was Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, Chuck E. Cheese was the one who went out of business. I, I know that raises a lot of questions, but bear with me here. In 1984, Nolan Bushnell was signed as CEO of Pizza Time Theater, and the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. This could have just been the end of it. Pizza Time Theater would have lost all their money and gone out of business. Chuck E. Cheese and the Pizza Time players would have faded into obscurity. Showbiz would have won, and that would be it. But Showbiz, still owing money to PTT after the lawsuit, decided they could get out of this little contingency if they just bought Chuck E. Cheese. So they did, and the two companies merged, becoming Showbiz Pizza Time Inc. 1985. From here, things would change. Chuck E. and Billy Bob, having previously been depicted by third parties as bitter rivals, began being depicted as total besties in official content. Their marketing would become more and more similar to a near indistinguishable point. <laughs> If you were around during this time and have muddy memories about the branding of these two chains or which one you frequented as a kid, this is most likely why. The two restaurants became basically perfectly synonymous. It was a powerhouse again. There was just one annoying little cog in this machine, and his name was Aaron Fector. See, around this time, Aaron, or rather his company Creative Engineering Inc., was getting into progressively worse beefs with Showbiz Corporate. The Rock of Fire prided itself on having a new show tape from the band every month, and CEI had picked up a bad habit of turning in these show tapes late. Showbiz had already been producing their own show tapes and animatronics for Chuck E. Cheese following the merger, and decided that if CEI wasn't going to make the deadlines for show tapes, that they could do it themselves. 
In March of 1986, Showbiz released the first ever Rock of Fire show tape that was made entirely without any involvement from CEI. This means the show was recorded and programmed entirely by SPT, meaning it didn't use the original voice actors. Hello folks, we're back, and uh, today is Trivia Day here at Showbiz Pizza Place, and we're uh, asking all kind of trivia questions. Well, I think it's about time to tell you about my new invention. This is my first night ever opening up a show totally from scratch, so mark it on your calendars, okay? Oh, that's what a wonderful invention. I can hardly believe it's true. So we'll be asking some trivia questions uh, based around the songs that we're doing or around the time that the songs were recorded. That? What about me? Could I try? Now, I don't know what the audience reaction to this was at the time, but I can tell you with certainty that everyone in the animatronics fandom these days hates the sound alike's corporate showbiz came up with for the band. And I can say with equal certainty that Aaron hated them too. CEI retaliated by taking away showbiz's exclusivity rights to the Rock of Fire explosion, meaning CEI can now put the band in any restaurant they wanted. Showbiz would soon swap their corporate voice actors for new ones, but they still didn't really hold a candle to the original voices. Everybody looks sharp, it's work time. You mean it's play time? Right, Duke, because when we're playing, we're working. Tell it, Bitsy. CEI wouldn't produce another show tape for showbiz until later that year for their 4th of July show tape, but even then it was only half of one, the other half still being corporate voiced. In 1987, they would return to consistently producing show tapes for showbiz, but now only produce the audio. Showbiz would handle the programming and other features for the shows. The reason showbiz took over the programming is interesting. Here's the story according to the SPT archives on YouTube. As stated earlier, this show was the reason CEI was not allowed to program shows going forward. Apparently following the release of SPP Time Machine slash Hits 1, SPT gave CEI one more chance to prove themselves with programming with this very show. CEI had finished programming the show and had it ready to be sent to showbiz corporate, but before sending the show tape to corporate, CEI had a party in celebration of completing the tape. Now it is stated that employees of CEI used to get pretty drunk during these parties and this one was no different. At some point during the party, a drunk employee had erased all the data from the tape, with the date to ship the tape to Showbiz being the next morning. Needless to say, Showbiz wasn't very happy about this and would program the Liberty Show themselves. Following this incident, Showbiz would continue to produce their own Rock of Fire show tapes for the next year with the voice impersonators, eventually letting CEI back into show production in late 1987. Although just for show audio, as SPT would still maintain programming rights right until their partnership with CEI ended in 1990. With all this in mind, I think it's clear how rough the waters were between CEI and SPT at the time. That's why it's no- no su- That's why it's no surprise that- Do you hear music? No, this is- No, I'm not gonna- No! Tangent 3, final- Talk about Uncle Clunk. Uncle Clunk was the first guest character for the Rock of Fire explosion. He was introduced in 1983 as an attempt to increase revenue during their ongoing financial troubles. At the time, he was creative engineering's most sophisticated character. Clunk can pick things up. It's kind of terrifying. He's the funniest robot science ever made. Hello, you're on the air with Uncle Clunk. <laughs> oh, I get it. You're doing your impression of a telephone ringing. What are you, some kind of nut? <laughs> I'd say you were more some kind of fruit, actually. <laughs> Beautiful. Speaking of terrifying, let's get the elephant out of the room while it's still here. Everyone thought Clunk was ugly and scary looking. Everyone still thinks Clunk is ugly and scary looking. Someone wrote a creepy pasta about Uncle Clunk. Even I hated Clunk for a good while. But if I've learned anything from BH Bear, it's that the best personalities can sometimes be lying under less than the most appealing cosmetics. In listening to his show tapes during my research for this video, I've come to actually kind of love Clunk. No Clunk slander in my comments, okay? Uncle Clunk's whole bit was that he ran a sort of wacky talk show along with his bird sidekick Click, later renamed Murray D. Bird. He'd run fake news segments, kick calls from viewers, and had a range of other little segments he'd do. He was originally voiced by Jeff Howell, an employee and musician at CEI. Aaron Fector had wanted to give him a larger role as almost thanks for his work behind the scenes, so he gave Jeff his own character to voice. Clunk was even designed as an exaggerated take on Jeff's appearance. Unfortunately, Clunk was met with mixed reviews from corporate showbiz after hearing Jeff's demo tape. They hired a professional company to write and record Clunk's tapes, who would change much about Clunk's personality in a show. This was what ended up being used in the actual restaurants. Possibly because of this change, audience reactions of Clunk were also mixed. He was billed as a quote, abomination, and the running gag seemed to be that nobody actually quite liked Clunk. Hey, listen, before we do the next song, what did y'all think of uh, Uncle Clunk over there? Wasn't he all right? Just listen to that crowd. Boy, I'll tell you, that's some real approval. <laughs> I know, Looney Bird, that's because Uncle Clunk is a uh, real abomination. 
There were only around 50 Uncle Clunks ever made, as Clunk was a traveling act, both in the fiction and literally. He'd occupy stage right when a location had it, meaning they'd have to take Rolf and Earl out and thus vastly limit which show tapes they could play. So Clunk would only stick around in locations that had him for a couple months, and then they'd move him on to a different location. Enjoy Uncle Clunk. He'll be here for a couple of months only, and so y'all have a good time and bring your friends back to see him. And then he's going to be going on to bigger and, uh, well, never mind. Clunk also had a good handful of variants, I guess? I almost hesitate to call them retrofits, even though that's basically what they were. In late 1984, Clunk's first variant took the stage of Santa Claus, voiced by Burt Wilson, the same voice actor for Fats. He only ever had one show tape made for him, one where the band waits excitedly for him to arrive, using Looney Bird's newly invented Super Santa Scanner! Eventually, he does show up and do a couple of Christmas carols with the group, minus Rolf and Earl, of course. Clunk's next variants would come not from creative engineering, but rather Showbiz themselves. In 1985, while they were butting heads with CEI, Showbiz had decided to take more into their own hands than just producing show tapes. They had a surplus of Clunks lying around, despite there only being 50 of them, and so they decided to put them to use by creating other attractions to the restaurant. One of these was Uncle Pappy, a more prospector-looking type character. He featured a bright ginger beard that was actually the same hair as Dolly Dimples, a CEC character at the time. He would sit in the game room rather than the showroom, and would sing short songs and give advice to kids. The other Clunk variant was perhaps the most unconventional, but by far my favorite. Somewhere during this time period, though the exact date is unknown, Showbiz did another test run of a Clunk-adjacent character. This one a literal deconstruction of Clunk himself. This character was named Orwell, a robot you control, and he was only ever tested in one location. Orwell could be featured as a bear mech, or as a mech wearing Clunk cosmetics that were split in half. For the price of one token, kids could take control of Orwell by pressing the buttons on the control panel in front of him, thus learning a bit about how the animatronics on stage work, too. Orwell even came with his own bit of merch, this button that apparently only has one surviving copy so far. Overall, I think Clunk was simply a man done dirty. From his conception to today, I genuinely consider him misunderstood, disrespected, and underrated. He was hated by executives, had his voice actor replaced an identity strip before he could even reach the stage, was disliked by audiences, reskinned and retooled more than almost any other showbiz character I can think of, only for those reskins to be considered failures, scrapped, forgotten, left only in our collective present day memories to be, what, considered ugly? Annoying? To have a creepypasta written about him? Jeff Howell couldn't even voice the character that was made for him. And this is how we remember Clunk? We owe it to him as a community to treat this character with more respect. Clunk deserves fan art. Clunk deserves to be the next Tumblr sexy man. Make it happen. Okay, I've, I've gotten away from myself. Okay, here. You've been watching the video for a while. Go take a water break or something. Stretch your legs. I don't know. I'm going to go cool off. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Hi. I'm feeling better now. Let's see, where did I leave off? Uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, clunk, creative engineering, uh, beef and showbiz, corporate tapes, how rough the waters were. No surprise when... Oh. Oh. Right, okay. Um. <clears throat> so, CEI and showbiz have been fighting with each other like this for quite some time now. CEI stopped turning in show tapes on time. Showbiz started making their own show tapes and everyone hated them. CEI took away their exclusivity rights to the Rock of Fire. Showbiz took even more into their hands and started mutilating Clunk. And it eventually came to a boiling point. So SPC was sick of dealing with creative engineering and Aaron Factor. Like I said, they've been producing Chuck E. Cheese show tapes and animatronics in-house for a good while now, so why not just do the same with the Rockfire animatronics? Cut CEI out of the equation entirely. Of course, CEI would refuse to let this happen. Remember Aaron's fear that Atari would reverse engineer his animatronics and put him out of a job? Showbiz and Pizza Time Theater were becoming synonymous to the general public at this point. This led corporate to decide to merge the two brands entirely. One restaurant chain, one mascot, one animatronic band. According to Aaron, in 1988, Corporate approached him with a request for him to sign away the rights to the Rock of Fire explosion. He declined, both on the grounds that he wanted to expand the Rock of Fire into other mediums like TV and movies, and that SPG apparently wasn't offering any monetary compensation for the rights. But you gotta realize, back then, I still felt like the Rock of Fire explosion had a big future. Movies, cartoons. I wanted to go someplace else with the Rock of Fire explosion besides pizza restaurants. I wasn't ready just to give it up. And besides, they didn't offer me a plug nickel for the copyrights. 
When I spoke to Jean Cram about this, who proposed to me that I give them the copyrights to the Rock of Fire Explosion, the trademarks, the copyrights, all ownership of the copyrights, he said, Aaron, what you get out of this is that your characters, Billy Bob, will live. They'll live on. But let me tell you something, if you don't accept this deal and if you don't give us your copyrights, your characters are gonna die. We're, we're gonna get rid of them and we're gonna replace them with Chuck E. Cheese. While I understand his decision, this would unfortunately ultimately make things easier for SBT. Because they weren't able to get the rights for the Rock of Fire Explosion, the brand that they would assimilate the other into would have to be Chuck E. Cheese. In 1990, Showbiz began this process of merging both brands into one, called concept unification. This essentially involved the rebranding of every Showbiz pizza location into a Chuck E. Cheese. Signs and other labeling were changed, of course, but what most likely matters to us all the most is what they did with the animatronics. Concept unification saw the dismantling of every Rock of Fire stage, retrofitting the characters into newly redesigned Chuck E. Cheese characters. There were some concepts tossed around about what Rock of Fire mechs would be used for what CUC character, but ultimately the list goes like this. Fats was turned into Mr. Munch, Mitzi was turned into Helen Honey, Duke was turned into Pasquale P. Pipeplate, Beach Bear was turned into Jasper T. Jowls, Looney Bear was turned into Pizza Cam, and Rolf was turned into Chuck E. Cheese himself. Some stages also kept Choo Choo around, turning him into Munch Jr. The only two characters that weren't saved in some capacity were Earl, most likely because the only part of his actual mech was a face in place of Rolf's right hand, and Billy Bob. I have to wonder if there's a reason they didn't do anything to salvage the mechs of Showbiz's mascot. The actual process of retrofitting these characters and redecorating the stage took several days of course, so Showbiz made one final tape to play while the concept was in the process of being unified, the Rolf and Rolf show. Done with corporate voices of course, this was a show tape that played exclusively using stage right. This way shows were still able to play in some capacity, even if Billy Bob and the entirety of center stage were in various stages of being retrofitted. Employees would retrofit stage right lashed over the course of one night, and the Rock of Fire explosion would be fully gone by the next day, replaced by Munch's make-believe band. I believe the debut show tape for these versions of the characters is a well-liked one in the Chuck E. Cheese community, but while I can understand the appeal, I personally have trouble fully enjoying these versions of the characters. I can't shake the feeling that they're not supposed to be like that, you know? It feels like corporate killed the Rock of Fire, put different skin on them, and then put them back on stage, forcing them to continue to perform as if they'd always looked like this. Which is a shame, because I think these CU animatronics are the best looking iteration of Munch's make-believe band that we've gotten. I just wish they weren't, you know... There's a kind of inherent horror to the concept of concept unification that I've tried to explain before to varying degrees of success. This is from a gag TikTok account, but I think they actually managed to sum it up pretty well. Well, howdy everybody, I'm Billy Bob, and I'm here at the 5th Showbiz Pizza Place here in West Des Moines, Iowa at 3 a.m. I haven't been here in over 30 years, so let's go ahead and see if my friends are here. Oh, there they are. Hello, hey guys. Hey, Rolf, can you see me? Mitzi, you can hear me, right? Fats? Come on, Fats, you can hear me. Beach Bear? Duke? Well, you're on my old stage. None of them can hear me, they're all sleeping. But horrors aside, cons of unification effectively killed the Rock of Fire explosion in the public consciousness. Aaron was cut off by showbiz, them not needing him anymore. So, now what? Tangent 4. Love, Death, and Robots. So, Aaron and Showbiz have finalized their divorce or whatever, and what does one do after a really bad breakup? Rebound, of course. So here's an overview of some of the ventures Aaron and Showbiz, but mostly Aaron, pursued after or soon before this breakup. The Statue of Liberty. Introduced in 1986, the Statue of Liberty was another guest character for the Rock of Fire, like Clunk and Santa Claus. 1986 was the real Statue of Liberty's 100th anniversary, so Showbiz had her made as part of their 4th of July celebration show tape that year. This was also that one show tape that was half produced by Showbiz and half produced by Creative Engineering. The Statue of Liberty is the only guest character in Showbiz history to be implemented in every location simultaneously. Interesting given that she was only really used that one time. In 1997, while Showbiz was putting in their efforts of trying to phase out the Rock of Fire, they decided they wanted to try out putting licensed characters on stage instead to reach a wider audience. This wasn't unheard of as shows like the Looney Tunes Review existed in the 80s as well. Showbiz would settle on using Hanna-Barbera's Yogi Bear and Boo Boo, retrofits of Rolf and Looney, respectively. They were trial tested in three Showbiz locations for a year, after which they were discontinued. In 1985, Aaron Fetcher had found himself with a surplus of Rock of Fire explosion shows that had yet to be sold. To help increase CEI sales, he created the Moon Rockers. You know, from the city inside the moon. This 
band was a space-themed retrofit of a Rockefeller Center stage, consisting of Princess Haley, retrofitted from Mitzi, Quasar, retrofitted from Beach Bear, Admiral Orc, retrofitted from Fats, and Ozone, retrofitted from Duke. It also included retrofits of Choo Choo and Antioch, turning them into Mulgama and Sismus, respectively. Little has survived about the Moonrockers, probably partially because Aaron managed to sell a whopping none of these stages, but they've begun to see a bit of resurgence of popularity lately. Who knows? Maybe there's more content of them out there we've yet to find. In the early 90s, Creative Engineering did their own experiment with non-original characters, making a show based on The Wizard of Oz. There's very little I can find about the show online, mostly that the Tin Man was a Mitzi retrofit, and based on the other's movements, I want to say at least the Scarecrow is as well. I've also heard these animatronics were originally made for a dark ride, but I don't know how true this is. This fucking clown. I don't think anyone knows anything for sure about this thing. His name, when he was made, what he was made for. The consensus seems to be that he was posted at a kiosk, maybe in a mall, and would direct passersby to a nearby attraction. Aaron calls it the evil clown. Evil clown. He showed his pizza like he calls it creepy clown, so at least there's one thing everyone agrees on. Hannah Banana, finally something we know more about. In 2007, a restaurant named Hannah Banana was opened in the UK, featuring an animatronic monkey of the same name, courtesy of Creative Engineering. She was a retrofit of Mitzi, and the show also included Billy Bob and Looney Bird as they appeared in the Rock of Fire. There were a total of 18 shit tapes produced for the restaurants, but most of these are lost media to my knowledge. Hannah Banana only lasted about a year or two before her restaurant was closed. By the way, remember when I said Clunk had the most retrofits out of almost any showbiz character I could think of? If there's a winner for most, I have to imagine Mitzi takes the cake. I mean, how many have we covered now? Four? Five? Anyway, moving on. The Hard Luck Bears Jam- God damn it! Remember the Hard Luck Bears? Also known as the Country Bear Jubilee, also formerly known as the Bear Country Jubilee, definitely not a ripoff of the Country Bear Jamboree. Yeah, apparently Aaron brought these guys back after concept unification as the Hard Luck Bears Jamboree. These guys were yet another retrofit of the Rock of Fire, commissioned for the Gulliver's Kingdom, Gulliver's Land, and Gulliver's World theme parks in England. These characters all go by the same names, but are voiced by Gulliver's employees and have been given new outfits. The non-bear characters have also been given new bear masks. Around 2015 to 2017, these shows fell into disrepair and all stopped operating, but there's been efforts to restore them. The Gulliver's World show had a soft reopening in late 2022, and is expected to reopen for real sometime this year. But enough goofing off. You want to know what happened to the Rock of Fire, so let's get to it. In 1991, while concept unification was going on, Aaron was experimenting with new ways to sell animatronics to people. His patched retrofit shows hadn't really worked, so the next move was to try something completely new. This came in the form of a new style of animatronic invented by CEI employee Chris Lanus. He had previously worked with miniature animatronic animation, and he worked with Aaron to make his animatronics smaller and more lightweight. Because of their size, Aaron nicknamed these animatronics Midgens. Midgens? Really? And you're sure it's because of the size? Really? Oh man, okay. Do I have to keep saying that name? Shit, okay. Okay, so, Aaron took these new animatronics and created a new show in 1992 simply called The, the Midgens. This stage featured six human animatronics, a redesigned version of Billy Bob and Fats, and a bear mech called The, the Midgenator, are you serious? Ugh. This was only the start of this style of animatronic though, as Aaron would debut not just a new stage using them, but the comeback of the Rock of Fire explosion altogether. Sorta. Of. The new Rock of Fire explosion, produced between 92 and 96, was the Rock of Fire explosion's official return. This time, they came with what CEI called Danceatronic technology, allowing all the members of the Rock of Fire to sing, dance, and even move around the stage. Sorta. Of. Rather, the stage itself moved, every part of it, in fact. The layout consisted of three stages like before, but each one were on an individual turntable. Stage left featured a TV screen on one side and Duke on the other. Stage left featured Looney Burn on one side and the Beach Bear and the smaller Looney on the other. And center stage featured Fats, Mitzi, and Billy Bob. The characters on center stage also had smaller turntables just under their feet. So when the larger one on the stage moved, they could rotate as well to appear facing forward, or they could turn while stationary to appear as if the characters were turning their whole bodies. There's two things that may immediately come to mind upon seeing the new Rock of Fire, and that's their redesign and the lack of Rolf and Earl. Yeah, Rolf and Earl are just like gone now, I guess? The TV screen on stage left would play recorded video versions of classic show tapes alongside their performances by the new Rock of Fire, which could include Rolf and Earl, but they otherwise made new appearances in this version of the Rock of Fire. The new Rock of Fire explosion is also implied to take place after some sort of time skip, though the exact length of time is never specified, hence the character's new designs. Let's take a moment to go through them all. Billy Bob appears in the new Rock of Fire donning a snazzy new outfit, and he put on a shirt for the first time. He's notably skinnier, which he explains as having lost some weight. His profile in this little introductory thing from back then says he dreams of a recording career, but makes it seem like he's not reached it yet. Based on his new look, I'd say he's well on his way. Though I do miss the rounder Billy Bob. I give this a 6 out of 10. Fats' outfit hasn't actually changed all that much, but he's notably lost some weight as well. 
His bio clocks him in at 850 pounds, so I can't imagine how heavy he was in the classic rock of fire. Fats has always been a little short, but his width in the tune machine always made up for that and kept him looking somewhat imposing. The lack of both here kind of just makes him look a little pathetic, and not to mention younger, sort of taking away his parental vibe. 3 out of 10. Mitzi's been totally glammed up in this design, and I absolutely adore her new outfit. While still portrayed as somewhat young, she does seem to be a couple years older by now, and she carries almost an elegant vibe here. But, uh, her hair. What happened to the, the hair? She's sometimes given this large 80s hair, which I do appreciate more than her being, like, bald, but wasn't this look sort of going out of style by this time? I would've been fine if we just got a more modest hairstyle, something like if classic Mitzi had just let her hair out of those pigtails, but that's really a nitpick. 7 out of 10. I can't say I really prefer any of the new Rock of Fire designs over the classic ones, but if any come really close, it's Duke's. This more casual outfit, I think, fits his personality very well, and it's something I might unironically wear in real life where I'm a little more gutsy with my fashion. It is a bit sad to lose him see his space theming, though. Despite him not talking about it that much, Duke's true dream was to go to space. And now he's living in a junkyard? What happened? Did he give up on his dreams or something? What the hell? 6 out of 10, though, because I still love him to bits. Beach Bear's new look is... I don't, I don't care for it. Why is he so puffy? Why is his head so big and his body so little now? You give him a shirt. Beach Bear doesn't wear shirts. That's like his whole thing. That and playing guitar, but nobody plays instruments anymore. Ow. This isn't a bad design on its own, but it isn't Beach Bear. This is like Beach Bear's little brother Sandbox Bear, 2 out of 10. I saved Looney Bird for last, not just because he has the most drastic change out of the new Rock of Fire, but also my favorite. Looney Bird confirms more than perhaps all the others that there's been a time skip between the two versions of the band, because he's actually gotten his life together since the classic show. Remember how Looney Bird wanted to become an inventor and a programmer? I mean, he technically kind of already was by this point, but not to this extent. There's even a whole show segment dedicated to like him stumbling on following his dreams and almost giving up, but with the love of his friends, he decided to continue and push through, and, and now, look at him! Look at him, he's got a diploma! He's certified! 9 out of 10. Speaking of Looney Bird, we should at least briefly mention Looney Birds, one of the few places the new Rock of Fire actually sold to. This place was a typical arcade restaurant like Showbiz or Chuck E. Cheese's, but with Looney Bird as the mascot and featuring the new Rock of Fire. It's kind of weird to think about, Looney basically getting the Pete's arcade equivalent of like one of really popular sitcom ends, and they make a spin-off starring the goofy supporting side character, which inevitably fails because the goofy supporting side character is best in small doses, like how they were in the original, and putting them in a prominent role basically unchanged is just a functionally bad idea. Not that Looney as a character fell prey to that second part, but maybe the Rock of Fire as a whole sort of did. There's a lot to like about the new Rock of Fire, but there's also a lot to dislike. All the characters are the exact same size and shape now, they don't play any of their instruments anymore, their mechs all have the same capability, meaning none of them have any unique movements anymore. Like, classic Beach Bear can move his legs. Beach Bear and Looney Bird can cross their eyes, the others couldn't do that. Fats and Billy Bob have the ability to tilt their heads, adding an extra layer of expressiveness that the others didn't necessarily have. At least not in that specifically, because despite Mitzi not being able to tilt her head, she could close her eyes, which Billy Bob can't do. It's an ability she has that makes her more expressive during long or high notes that not everyone else can do. They all had something that made them special, unique. That was part of what gave them so much personality. The new Rock of Fire strips them of that. And while I have to be impressed by the technology of making the stage move, by the technology that made the new Rock of Fire real, it just, it feels too little too late at this point. I mean, Showbiz was dead by now. Concept unification ended in 1992, the same year the new Rock of Fire debuted. At some point, I have to wonder if it would have been best to just let sleeping dogs lie. Or dead bears, I suppose. The new Rock of Fire explosion would only sell a couple of stages, to a handful of places that have all either since removed the band or gone out of business entirely. It's a genuinely sad song swan, I have to admit. I can't help but wonder what these characters would be like if they'd had the opportunity to continue on to the present day like Chuck E. Cheese did. Actually, speaking of Chuck E. Cheese, I feel like we ought to check up on those guys. As part of concept unification, all the Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time players were given new looks. They became Munch's make-believe band, and this era became known as the Tux era, because Chuck had been given a tux to wear. This is my favorite era, personally, and like I've said, I kind of think these animatronics look fantastic. A biased take, maybe, but my take nonetheless. Stages featuring retrofits of the Rock of Fire explosion were called three stages, since they were on, you know, three stages. In 1992, CEC began producing the one stage, which included the whole band on, you guessed it, one stage. These animatronics were made by Chuck E. Cheese themselves, called Cyberamics. There's still a good handful of these stages left around these days, so you may have one near you, or you may remember growing up with a location that had a one stage. Hell, there's even a single digit amount left of the three stages out there. If you're super lucky, you might happen to live near one. And around 1997, the gang was once again redesigned, beginning the Avenger era. I have no idea why this is called that, and I don't think anyone else does. The Avenger era gave Chuck a cooler, more relatable to teenagers vibe, and it also gave him the iconic outfit that most people know him by. 
I don't think it's a stretch to say this is most people's favorite era, both for people who are already into Chuck E. Cheese and outsiders who only care much for what they grew up with. Regardless, I think there's a reason why this design is so popular. It's maybe the first time Chuck E. Cheese's design has ever really come off as relatable to kids. He's depicted as much older in earlier incarnations. His first ever design even had him smoking a cigar. I can't imagine many kids felt exactly comfortable around old Chuck. I wouldn't let my kids stay with him at least, but Avenger Chuck, that's my son's cool friend from school. It was around this time as well that a stage most of you will be familiar with debuted, Studio C. If you didn't grow up with the one stage in your local Chuck E. Cheese, you almost certainly grew up with the Studio C. There's three versions of Studio C, Alpha, Beta, and Kappa. I believe the majority of locations with stages these days have a Studio C Beta, including my local Chuck E. Cheese. This stage only featured one animatronic, Chuck himself. The rest of the characters will appear on the screen to the side in the form of puppets, kind of reminiscent of the TV on the new Rock of Fire stage. I really, really love this version of Chuck's animatronic, and if we had ever had the opportunity to see the full band like this, it would have easily become my favorite incarnation of the band. In 2012, a similar stage format to the Studio C would debut, called the Circles of Light stage, for again, obvious reasons. This stage setup was largely the same as Studio C, but was also the first stage locations could purchase with the option of not having an animatronic at all. There are a few other Chuck E. Cheese stages in smaller eras, and maybe that's something I'll make a video about in more in depth someday for the uninitiated. But for now, let's move on to the other important thing that happened that year. In 2012, after sales had started to tank for the company, Chuck E. Cheese again decided to make a move for the fairly controversial and redesigned Munch's make believe band once again. This era is known as the Rockstar era, and it's what we're currently still in now. Chuck got a guitar, a much smaller figure, and got his tail back. They also changed the patch of skin on his face to simply a lighter gray tone of fur and OH GOD THEY TOOK HIS HAT! NO! Yeah, the internet wasn't really happy about this one when it was first revealed. Now though, eh, nobody really cares anymore. In the CEC fandom, there's still a good handful of people that will give you a whole essay about why the Avenger era is the best and Rockstar is a huge pile of crap, but the Rockstar era has its fans too. I mean, they're all toddlers, but in fact, the Rockstar redesign isn't even the most controversial thing CEC has done in recent years. Instead, that have to go to... <sighs> Do I have to talk about this? I just got over Comics Beautification, man. I, I just talked about the death of the Rockifier. Come on. Fine. In May of 2015, Chuck E. Cheese debuted the first of a new stage type called Chuck E. Live. This stage, also known simply as the dance floor, is the first to contain exactly zero animatronics. Instead, entertainment is provided by a big screen that plays videos of the puppet versions of the characters along with other content like kids bop music videos, and an employee in a walk around will come around every so often to do a dance along with the kids. Obviously, this is a hugely disappointing development for animatronics fans. I mean, the animatronics were the original selling point for Chuck E. Cheese. To get rid of them is to get rid of the very soul of the restaurant. But despite all that, CEC Corporate has been continuing with this project for eight years now as part of a CEC 2.0 initiative. But Juno, I hear you cry. You said that there were mostly Studio C betas left. I heard you say that I said out of the locations that still had stages. Sure, there's 88 locations that have a Studio C beta. There are over 275 dance floor locations. I mean, this is alarming. In fact, I just did the math, and if you add up how many of every location has a stage of any sort left, you only get 212. The dance floor is over half of all Chuck E. Cheese's now. They're coming for everyone. They'll come for you next, your wife, your children. Why won't anyone think of the children? This is such a distressing thing for so many reasons. It's like watching a species go extinct. It's like deforestation. If these Chuck E. Cheese animatronics go extinct, really the only ones we'll have left are at Disney. And Disney is too good at animatronics now. It's scary. Are we really going to let them all but monopolize the animatronics industry? And don't even get me started on the media preservation side of things. Chuck E. Cheese already has a reputation for kind of obscuring their history for basically no reason. But when these locations get rid of their animatronics, employees are directly told to destroy them beyond recognition. And we're all just standing by because, like, I mean, well, what can we do? The fact of the matter is, despite what I personally want to believe, the general public just doesn't seem to care about comparatively rudimentary animatronics designed to show pizza and arcade games to kids in an age of home and mobile gaming and DiGiorno. Kids these days just don't seem to get animatronics anymore. I wonder why that is. Surely nothing could have occurred in the past decade, perhaps around 2014, that would have caused kids growing up at that time to view animatronics differently. Five Nights at Freddy's is a video game created by Scott Cawthon that released on August 8, 2014. Scott Cawthon had a history with making point-and-click games in the past, but had been faced with continuously poor reception for his work. One particular comment about how his anthropomorphic animal characters are more reminiscent of creepy animatronics rather than the friendly creatures he'd intended them to be inspired Scott to make one final game before throwing in the towel on game development entirely. 
And then the game blew the absolute fuck up and he made like nine more, and then he said some controversial shit and most people just try not to think about him anymore. I don't need to explain what FNAF is to you. Everybody knows what FNAF is. My mom knows what FNAF is. You can't go into a GameStop anymore without being drowned in FNAF merch. When I first mentioned animatronics at the start of this video, how many people watching first thought about Five Nights at Freddy's? Genuine question. Like, seriously, comment and tell me how far into this video you got before you made the connection. Now, I want to make clear now. I do not hate Five Nights at Freddy's. I am a FNAF fan. I've been a FNAF fan since the first game came out, and despite all the warning signs, I have not stopped being a FNAF fan since. I do not think FNAF is responsible, at least not single-handedly, for the extremely prevalent phobia of animatronics and mascots that has existed much longer than FNAF has. I do not think FNAF is responsible, at least not single-handedly, for the decline of the animatronics industry or events like CEC 2.0. I do not hate FNAF. I like FNAF. I do not hate FNAF. Are we clear? Good. Now, I need every FNAF fan who clicked on this video to kindly delete their comment about how these characters are just like FNAF, like, oh my god, it's just like this one game called Five Nights at Freddy's, have you ever heard of it? These animatronics totally ripped off of, oh my god, there's a bear character? That's just like Five Nights at Freddy's, I know it's like Five Nights at Freddy's, I've played the games, I know there's a bear in the game, I know there's animatronics, I know all that! It is not impossible to go anywhere in the animatronics community that is even remotely public facing without seeing a flood of FNAF comments. None of you are original. None of your jokes are funny anymore. Half of them aren't even jokes. Some of them you just like kind of comment FNAF, like with no other elaboration. And I think those are like from kids, but like, I don't, I don't know what you think you're supposed to get. Like, this is, I'm, I'm off script right now, but like, why do you do that? Like, it's not that making one FNAF joke is gonna send me into an absolute meltdown or anything, but it just seems like a lot of these people, not all, of course, but a lot of them seem to act like these real animatronics from the 70s are just like FNAF, as if FNAF came first and not the other way around. I know Freddy Fazbear and Billy Bob are both bears, I know that, but consider for a second that Freddy Fazbear is a bear because of Billy Bob. Show some respect to your elders. Despite the irreparable damage that FNAF has done to, like, my TikTok comments, I also can't deny that FNAF is responsible in some part for getting people in the modern day into animatronics as a whole. It's a double-edged sword, I think, FNAF being horror media and also sort of the only pop culture media to feature animatronics at all in the decade sandwiching it can reinforce the fear of the animatronics that many people have, and can instill that fear into people that might not have otherwise had it. But at the same time, I don't know if I personally would have even remembered animatronics really existed in the real world at the ripe age of 22 if it were not for FNAF. Because of that, I eventually became interested in real animatronics, at first through the lens of creepy videos of animatronics in disrepair. This bloomed into a genuine love of animatronics in the video you're watching now. I know plenty of other people who've gotten into animatronics for real through FNAF, so I guess I can't really write off FNAF as all bad, can I? But like, really guys, you gotta get more than one joke. The state of animatronics right now is precarious. We're in an era of change right now, but I can't really say if this change is for better or for worse. In June 2020, CEC Entertainment filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, thus the serpent from 1983 consumes its own tail. But it seems like they're doing alright right now financially. CEC 2.0 is inevitable, sadly, but we know this isn't the end of the CEC characters. Animatronic technology is kind of insane these days. Disney's doing projected phases, then electronic animatronics, and, and cars. They're doing shit that moves around on its own, stuff that flies. Technology-wise, the future of animatronics looks very bright. In terms of the kitschy stuff, it's not like stuff like Chuck E. Cheese is entirely gone yet either. In fact, if you've watched this far and you find yourself itching to look at some pizza animatronics yourself, there's a good handful of places to find one stages, three stages, hell, even some rock fire explosions are left out there. Billy Bob's Wonderland and Barbies of West Virginia host a rock of fire explosion, the last remaining public show in America. They're a regular arcade and pizza joint, just like in showbiz's heyday. While they mainly cater to the general public, they're also very aware of the Rock of Fire's fans. They've hosted a couple fan conventions at the store, and it seems to be a yearly thing now. The band used to be in very poor quality, but in recent years they've been completely revitalized, and they look great in the present day. They also make their own shows, so if you ever wanted to see the Rock of Fire perform a FNAF fan song, you're in luck here. Smitty Super Service Station in Little Improve, Mississippi is a semi-private museum run by Damon Breland. The place features a Rock of Fire stage, a Pizza Time Players balcony stage, a new Rock of Fire Looney Bird, and tons of vintage merch. You can request a visit there by contacting Damon on his website. The Rock of Fire Bar, a bar in Kansas City, Missouri that hosts the Rock- Ow! Oh! Fun Billiards and Game Room Superstore in Mesquite, Texas is actually currently in the process of building a stage left of the Rock of Fire in their store. They have both the Billy Bob and Looney animatronics already and they both look fantastic. International fans, don't worry, there's also a couple shows outside the US as well, like Thunderland, a traveling Rock of Fire show in Ireland features- Oh no! Dream Factory in Switzerland hosts a full Rock of Fire band. They were previously in very rough condition cosmetics wise, but are in the process of being refurbished. This band is a bright future, I think. Scandia Golf and Games in Canada has- No! No! 
on the Chuck E. Cheese end of things, you can find three stages in Huntsville, Alabama, Charlotte, North Carolina, Visalia, California, Tallahassee, Florida, Augusta, Georgia, West Des Moines, Iowa, Billings, Montana, and Altoona, Pennsylvania. There's also 23 remaining one-stage shows and 17 two-stage shows, both of which feature the whole band of Cyberamics. When you put things like this, it doesn't feel so lonely anymore, I think. And hey, you know what? This may not even be the end of the Kitschy Pizza animatronics. It's all just super in right now. It may just be a matter of time until these companies catch on to the idea and bring back the old days, even if just for a little bit. Even the Rockefeller might make another comeback. Remember those old Gen 2 animatronics? Aaron's apparently still working on those to this day. I wonder if they'll ever get finished, and if they do, if they'll be any good. It'd be awesome to see these characters revitalized, and it's really admirable that Aaron is still dedicating himself to animatronics in the Rockefeller. He sounds like a really chill guy. Why do I feel like I'm forgetting something? I have to be candid about something. I do not want to write this section. I don't want to make this section at all. I've been writing the script and recording and editing since January. For months. I'm typing these words right now at the end of March. I'm recording this on July 9th. And I have no clue how much longer it's going to be until these words reach you. It's been a long time. And in that time, I have so fully immersed myself in the history of these animatronics and the good things about these animatronics that I've forgotten, almost. I wanted to forget, maybe. It was nice to focus on the fun stuff, and maybe that's why other videos I've seen in this vein don't talk about this. Maybe they just don't know. Maybe they want to focus on the good. I don't know. And I know what you're thinking. If I don't want to make this part, why am I making it? I'm making this video as a whole because I wanted to fill a niche within this niche that I had not seen. There's plenty of videos in the 20 to 30 minute mark that cover the history of these animatronics, and they're all great videos, I've watched a lot of them now, but there's two things that none I've found do. They all seem to cover both Chuck E. Cheese and the Rock of Fire, but with a lean towards Chuck E. Cheese, and I wanted to make one with a lean towards the Rock of Fire, since I prefer that band, they're my favorite animatronic band. The other reason is that a lot of them are not as thorough. I wanted to make a video that would go over everything in detail, show every aspect of the story behind these robots, especially because I find that the detail I looked for as a new fan was often very hard to find. Maybe my level of detail is too much for you, and in that case, well, first of all, why are you still here, and second, I'm not offended by that. Feel free to check out any other video covering Rock of Fire history, but I'm here to be thorough, and I would be missing something very major if I did not discuss Aaron Vector. So it's time to talk about the unfortunate side of the Rock of Fire. Let's start something more surface level, something you may have noticed by now. Fats Geronimo is a character based heavily on the South, and especially Southern Black culture. Most of the time when they're covering a song originally sung by a black person, they have Fats sing in the cover. He's inspired by Fats Domino, a black pianist, and like, like, come on, he's literally black. I mean, I know he's not a human, but like, I think you can start to see how a character so heavily implied to be black being a gorilla is, uh, yeah. Moreover, he's voiced by a white guy. But I hear you devil's advocates, I hear you say, but Juno, this was a different time. People didn't really have the perception of what's insensitive back then that we do now. Fats was equally based on his voice actor who grew up in Louisiana and is basing a lot of Fats' characterization off his legitimate and authentic experiences of his exposure to that culture. Obviously Aaron didn't intend anything offensive by it. It might look bad now, but surely you aren't accusing Aaron Vector of being a racist because of these character design choices that were made 40 years ago. And you know what? You're right. I do believe these examples were just things he didn't know would come off a certain way at the time. Despite these things still being worthy of criticism, I'm not accusing him of being racist for all that stuff. I'm accusing him of being racist for this. 50 years you've tried to be an outstanding figure, and now you lose your job if you ever said Eve of Destruction was originally written in 1965 by Barry McGuire. The original song is staunchly anti-war and was originally written to protest the Vietnam War. The version that Earl Schmerl sings in this video, while perhaps sharing a name and melody with the original Eve of Destruction, is but a hollow, closed-minded facsimile of the original. These lyrics seem to touch on just about every political subject you could think of for the time, and it tries its damn hardest to be as offensive as possible with each of them. Bizarre considering the original was banned from playing on the radio as it was considered too leftist for its time. I was in disbelief that these two songs could even be related. I checked in just about every way I could, and even then I still didn't believe it. I was certain this cover Earl sings was more of a cover of a parody someone else had written or something. Surely Aaron wouldn't have sat down with an anti-war song, took the time to change all of the lyrics to be about how snowflakes these days can't handle th the n-word, and then took even more time to record himself singing it, and then took even more time to program one of his animatronics made for children to sing it, and then record it and put it on YouTube? So I googled the lyrics, sure that someone from like 2005 or whatever must have covered it and they would come up. Except that didn't happen. I pulled no results that were even close to Eva Destruction. 
This is something Aaron Fector did entirely on his own. I legitimately don't know what to do with this information. Like, like I'm telling you about it, but like, what the fuck? Who's so petty about their political stance that they all but write an original song asserting it and giving a big preemptive middle finger to any potential dissenters? Right, Aaron Fector is. I ain't gay, but I never kissed a girl. I Ain't Gay is an original song written and performed by Aaron Fector as Billy Bob. It's presented as if Billy Bob has gotten tons of fan letters asking if he's gay, so much so that he was compelled to make a song about it. Well, howdy folks, I'm Billy Bob, and I get asked one question more than any other, and I've decided to answer that question in a song. But if you ask me, I don't believe anyone was sending Aaron fan mail asking if his characters were gay. The only times I've ever seen fans really reach out to creators to ask that is like at conventions with more modern IPs that usually have some queer baby ship already going on like Supernatural or Voltron or something. The Rock of Fire is none of those things. What I personally think happened, this is my little headcanon, is Aaron wound up on Tumblr or something one day and stumbled onto some fan art of, <gasps> no, it can't be. Billy Bob kissing a man? The Billy Bob, his character, his self ins I mean his mascot? Gay. This can't be true, he forbids it to be true. In fact, he's so personally offended by this teenager's art of a bear that he must spread the word via song. Billy Bob ain't gay. It seems Aaron isn't aware of the concept of death of the author, the inevitable phenomenon where upon an artist releasing a work, the fans of that work can and will interpret and iterate on it in any ways they personally want to. And there's not really anything the creator can do about that. For example, a musician may write a strongly anti-war song and send it out into the world, but he can't stop others from taking that song and interpreting it to be about how white people are oppressed now, actually. I wonder if he's ever heard of Rule 34. But hey, as overprotective of his character sexuality as he may be, this is even his seemingly inclusive explanation for I Ain't Gay, that isn't necessarily a reflection on Aaron's overall thoughts on queer people or even his overall politics, right? Right? All lives will matter when black lives matter. Sorry, I call it like I see it. Quote, stupid, unquote. I'm not against the protesters. I just think they're being fooled by the Black Lives Matter organization. Sucker, Quillbine, and Sinker. Be all have fun, they'll be good. Why the hell is a Twitter account about an animatronic animal fan all of a sudden tweeting about politics? Maybe you have underestimated the depth of this particular project. The Rockefeller explosion is here to save he world, not just to keep your idle brain cells occupied while you chew on some cheese. Aaron, I do love you and all, but why are you trying to skim down your subscriber count? I know the air cylinder looks like fats, but please don't hurt other people's feelings telling them to screw themselves. This is not the person I want you to be. You are a big inspiration to me and always will be. I don't like the word shit and other stuff like that. Please don't do this. Good luck, Aaron. I love you. Thank you. Gamer, I only talk tough to people who deserve it. I'll take off the gloves for an insolent little pest who needs his, her, or its ass whip. It's the same Aaron you say you love, but if you love me, then love the Aaron that will tell a little anonymous piece of wasted flesh to shove his or her disrespect up his or her own orifice. I'm very happy to trim down my subscribers to just the nice people. Being next to jerks doesn't work. Trust me. I'm 66 years old, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's being nice to jerks doesn't work. You can take that to the bank. Wow, I follow for Rock of Fire content and not shitty boomer views on politics. Then beat it, fetus. I need to trim my subscriber list down. No stupid fetuses, please. On January 6th, the nation's house was a crime scene under Republicans. Unarmed trespassers invited by the FBI? While you jerks were out firebombing cop cars, killing blacks, and burning down your own cities? Don't make me laugh. We see you. We're taking our country back from you commies. Aaron, do you really, really like the Fox News? This may have been broadcast on Fox, but the same exact footage was broadcast on the lying mainstream media. Do you like the lying mainstream media? Have you not gotten tired of being lied to? It must be depressing to be promised so many times that they are going to get rid of Trump for you only to be beaten again. TDS on mainstream media. Do you really like that? Aaron, love the effort, design choice, enthusiasm, and love you put into your creation. Billy Bob and Fats couldn't mean more to me, but as much as I love the creations you make, we, the community of Rock of Fire, need you to please keep your opinions to yourself. If there's a joke that you want to share, please consider how others would feel before you post it. Thank you and good luck on Second Generation Duke. Sorry, homie don't play that game. You want Aaron, you get Aaron. 
You want some sanitized robot that follows the rules of the snowflake liberals? You gotta leave and hide in your safe spot. Don't tell me what my job is, and don't try to put me on Ritalin. Mental illness is for snowflake libs. A man who knows his mind and speaks his mind is a healthy man. Respect it, laugh with me, or go hide somewhere. And who shows respect to a pile of dog poop? Suckers. Like these bleeding liberals who think he should be given an ice cream cone and ask if he might step into the police car. Keep dreaming. Go Trump 2024. Make him re. Aaron, how do you feel about atheists? God loves them and understands why they don't believe in him. Some people are smart, and some just think they're smart, but they're not. They're dumb as rocks. God digs this, and isn't in the least worried about it, Imo. Is everyone allowed to participate in the auction, or are your haters banished from the auction? I'm confused as there doesn't appear to be a disclaimer on the website. People who hate me are welcome. People I hate are not welcome. We must keep up the criticism. There is no way we can bow to Islamic law in America. I hereby criticize Twitter for trying to enforce Islamic law on Americans using their service if this is indeed true. God damn it. I was just in an internet deep dive about the Rockefeller explosion only to find out the dude is Islamophobic. When will it end? You apparently know nothing about the Mideast. The Islamic hatred for my people, 9-11, the roots of terrorism, or practically anything else. But I'm sure with your tender few years on this earth, you have such wonderful fifis. So carry on and dream, my child. This would be banned on Facebook. They don't want you to know this. Call me paranoid, you stupid little blocked German girl, but you're the one who'll be eating bats when the new Green Deal takes away all your potential to be free and prosperous. And then he links to an InfoWars article, but the link is broken. Free tissues for lefties when Trump wins in 2024. Right. Even though I have very strong and proven correct political views, I never put them into shows on purpose. Of course, there are wackos out there who can find something wrong with everything. But I don't care about them. I'm just trying to be the last family entertainment production that isn't indoctrinating their kids with LGBTQ, BLM, Second Amendment, transgender, or vaccination opinions, or any of the rest of the crap they're forcing on our innocent children. Kids should have fun, and not made to feel guilty about anything they didn't do. Name one woman whose vagina Trump grabbed. Name one. I'll name one that Biden actually raped with his fingers. Tara Reid. Your move. Dear current premium subscribers and former premium subscribers, another day, another heartbreak. This time I am asking you all, my current share subscribers and former subscribers, to help me by viewing this horrible video and commenting on it, giving it a thumbs down, and helping me shame this video off of YouTube. My comment, if it has been removed, was this. This is worse than why I hired a new employee to learn a program and I handed them the buttons to see what they do and this was his first attempt. Is this just a joke? Intended to ruin what the Rock of Fire really is? If so, it is an amazing success. I am sorry, but I cannot allow you to do this to the public image of the Rock of Fire. Everyone understands that Bibbowill is a joke and the terribleness of that show is only understood because of the neglect of the owner. But to actually publish something this awful on purpose and ruin the possibility that the world may actually get to see a great Rock of Fire performance of this song someday is definitely such an ignorant sacrilege that I was not able to even watch this all the way through. Look what you've done to my life's work. How can anyone compliment this? Have I been wasting my time perfecting the synchronization of movements to music all these years? Yes, I am requesting that it be taken down. I can't believe that the fans are not horrified by this. Thank you for reading my true opinion of this most sickening insult. I'm sorry to have to give such a negative, but honest opinion of this joke of a programming job. I understand it is not all Braylon's fault, and that some of the blame is the inability of the programming equipment to accurately replicate the program signals because it's based on a Windows platform that cannot react fast enough for real-time events, and an underpowered source of air valve voltage that can't keep up with demand. But this is why I'll have to ask nicely, for now, that all home programming of Rock of Fire shows be kept off of YouTube. Thank you all for your help to get this removed by shame so that I don't have to spend $5,000 in legal fees to remove this when YouTube ignores my demand. Aaron. Elon is our hero. Fossey is a mass murderer. Not speaking to anyone in particular, just generally, I admit that if bully is a race, <laughs> then, I, then I am a racist. <laughs> anyone who acts with hate and violence to lies or truth, I reject. I stand with Ally on Laura Hubbard. 
biology is clear. It isn't hate, it is science that states, he still is and always will be a man. I will call him Laura to be nice, but scientifically, he is a man. At Danny Boy Start Tronical Pizza World 2003, I've explained this a hundred times. The song you're referring to was done in 2012 before there were any children watching the Rock of Fire explosion. I was playing to my Rock of Fire kids of the 80s who were all growing up. That's it. No children. None expected. Children started pouring in in 2015, and I've adjusted to their presence, but my use of the N-word was artistic, not racist. There's a big difference, but there's also a lot of ignorance in the world that doesn't understand that, and that is their problem. I'm honestly very worried about Aaron's mental health. He has come across as very unwell over the past month or so. You are indeed an amazing fool. I treat people the way they treat me. If you try to kick my ass, you get your ass kicked. Make sure you check that out next time you don't like something I say. Be sure and read what the person said to me. I never attack first. I never start a fight, but I sure as hell will finish one. Now, go look in the mirror and tell me if the person you see may need a little mental health checkup, because usually, he who calls someone else out for that is the one in need himself. Good luck to you. I'll pray for you, whoever you are, you anonymous psychiatry genius. Oh, okay. Thumbs up emoji. I am thinking of updating my fetuses label. My sister says it reminds her of abortions, which is sad because I am against abortions. And the truth is that fetuses are the most innocent and youngest of all human lives. I use the word to describe someone who knows absolutely nothing through no fault of their own, as they are simply so young. However, out of respect to my sister who thinks the word fetus is the word used to describe aborted babies, which is very futistic thinking, I will now say that if someone calls me a boomer, then they will be told that they are thinking futistically. Can you maybe just make a different account for this horseshit? Some of us care about the animatronics. I'm not interested in pandering to your fetish if you have no interest in my mind, my heart, and what truths the man behind your fetish believes in. Go find another hobby that just wants to take your money and leave you culturally and politically ignorant and bankrupt. What the fuck is your problem? Why would you accuse your fans of having a fetish for enjoying your goddamn art? Fuck you. You clearly were the victim of bad parenting. Shame on you! If I were your dad, I would take you behind the woodshed, light your ass up with a switch, and then hand you over to your mother and have your mouth washed out with soap. And then I would teach you respect. Cut. Aaron has quite the reputation online. Even if we were to put his politics aside, there still seems to be more than enough reasons for a Rock of Fire fan to dislike him. Let's talk about IP. This is the gray box. It's for some reason hard to find clear information on this from a technical standpoint, but the TLDR is that this is more or less the system that the Rock of Fire runs on. The one downside is that this tech hasn't really been updated since the 80s, meaning it's a little inaccessible for, say, people in the modern day who want to run a Rock of Fire show. Enter the blue box, created by David Ferguson, who, uh... <laughs> He did make the blue box, and like, again, I don't have the specifics, but from my understanding, the blue box is just like, better. What's more, you can use the blue box to program your own custom shows. So, some modern venues adopted the blue box so they could play shows to modern songs. Take for example, the Rock of Fire Arcade Bar in Kansas City, Missouri. They'd bought their show from Aaron, but used the blue box so they could play newer custom program shows from fans like Chris Thrash, one of the most dedicated Rock of Fire fans I've ever seen. But this use of the blue box displeased Aaron. He claims it's not because the shows featured adult content, but simply because he didn't program these shows. Again, Aaron, death of the author. The Rock of Fire bar closed just a year after it opened, following a lengthy feud between Aaron and the bar's owners. But that's a problem that only people who want to open their venue have to worry about, right? What about the rest of us schmucks who still want to program their own shows but don't have a show to do it with? Rock of Fire Replay was a free Unity game created by the 64th Gamer. In it, you could be in the room with several versions of the Rock of Fire stage, and even some other CEI shows. Simply by adding an away file and then pressing a bunch of buttons for 9 hours, you could program your very own virtual show for the Rock of Fire. It's unfinished, but as it stood, it was basically everything I could ever want as a Rock of Fire fan. But I talk about this game in the past tense for a reason, and it's because Rock of Fire Replay is no longer being worked on. Because of Aaron. I've heard conflicting reports, but the story seems to go that he either copyright claimed the game, forcing production to halt, or he harassed the 64th until he stopped production himself. His reasons for doing this also seem to be nebulous. He seems to believe that those in possession of Replay were, or at least could, make show tapes that were, quote, inappropriate, similar to his feelings on the blue box. 
18 naked cowboys in the showers at Ram Ranch. Which, Aaron, if you don't want inappropriate topics associated with your characters, then maybe don't make one of them say the N-word? And that's putting aside all the adult jokes they already do in canon. Aaron's also claimed that part of why he was against Replay was because he was working on his own Rock of Fire simulator. And you know what? I'd love to see an officially made Rock of Fire simulator. I really mean that. So let's take a look at the simulator he's been working on. Hi, my name's Ryan Hayes. I'm working with Aaron Factor, the creator of the Rock of Fire Explosion, to digitally recreate the animatronic band. We're going to 3D scan all of the animatronics, props, and the stage in order to very accurately recreate the band. I've worked closely with Aaron to ensure the controls and data structure mimic the real recording process. We also want to convert some of the existing show tapes to run in the simulator. We'll give those away for free on the Steam Workshop or just a simple download link. Along with that, we also hope to make it possible to convert your program show tapes to work with the real-life animatronic band. Here's the prototype we made to make sure this concept was feasible. If you press Alt, it'll start recording. If you press the Q key, it'll start opening the mouth and it'll record that movement. As a backer, you'll get to join us on this exciting journey and watch as the simulator gets developed. I think that we have something really special on our hands here. We just need your help. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm sure it's still coming. Since the end of Rock of Fire Replay, others have taken up the task of finishing what 64th started, with their products ranging from I feel unsafe here to holy shit, holy cow, holy smokes, this is everything I've ever wanted. Regardless of the quality though, these mods are all private, given out to only those close to the developers, because nobody wants to get sued by Aaron. So if you're like me with absolutely no connections in the fandom, you're kind of screwed. And if you're a mod maker who's watching this, please, 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 the 64th gamer himself went on to make more animatronic simulators, actually. Faz Anim, a FNAF-themed game, which I believe is actually totally complete, and Real to Real, a Chuck E. Cheese-themed game, which actually got really far in development and looked really promising, until he got a season and desist from Chuck E. Cheese, the company. Because 64th has a Patreon, they claimed he was making money off their brand, and you can't do that, and I'm still mad about it because from a legal standpoint they're right, but like, also, who was this really hurting? After the season, the assist, a bunch of people who were working on their mods in their own games, basically all of them, cancelled their projects, and thus the animatronic simulator genre died. You can still access archives of a few of these games on the Internet Archive, and again, if you get in good with a mod creator, you might be able to get theirs, but basically everyone's scared to make stuff now. Which is a really, really sad state for this fandom to be in. It's not just fan games, either. I'm, as the kids call them, a furry and a casual cosplayer. I decided I wanted to see if I could commission a fursuit of a Rock of Fire character, and I actually managed to find someone who had made a Rock of Fire fursuit before and of the character I wanted, so I DM'd them asking if they would be willing to make it again for me, and they said no because they were afraid that if they did it again, Aaron would try to get them in legal trouble. And the thing is, that's not even an unreasonable fear. While they may not always be legitimate lawsuits, Aaron does have a bit of history of trying to take people he doesn't personally like to court. Aaron, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do you realize how much you're shooting yourself in the foot with your astronomic levels of arrogance and stubbornness? You have a 43-year-old IP. Your characters are not doing anything right now. Your characters have not done anything since the 90s. The Rock of Fire explosion would have been forgotten after concept unification were it not for the fans. And not just the new ones, either. The fans who saw your band in their heyday and fell in love. The people like Chris Thrash. The people who showed their love and dedication to your product to my generation. The people who want to program their own shows with modern music. The people who want to make stuff like Rock of Fire Replay. The people who want to refurbish your shows. The people who want to make fursuits and gay fan art and multi-chapter fan fiction and two hour long video essays. Your fans, the fans of your product, that you aren't doing shit with right now. Your product that you keep saying you're doing stuff with, but Aaron, you haven't made a new Rock of Fire show tape in over 10 years. Were it not for places like Billy Bob's Wonderland and the Rock of Fire bar, there would be no place for people to see the band, and you hate them. You hate your fans. You love your fans, sure, but only when they fall in line and like your product exactly the way you think they should. Because if they don't, you call them fetuses and your enemies and you make up mean nicknames about them. These are the people that are keeping your brand alive. Because I sure as shit know you aren't. And in scaring them off, you are killing your brand. You are killing the Rock of Fire explosion, Aaron. There's so much I haven't even talked about. I could talk about how he treated his employees when he still had them. I could talk about his beef with Billy Bob's Wonderland. I could talk about the time he exploded his warehouse with the new fuel he was inventing and then continued to work on developing that fuel. I could talk about the fans that see no wrong in him, for what reason I really don't know. That's the worst part though, isn't it? That there's something about Aaron Fector that makes people like him regardless. He's a very pleasant sounding man, I'll give him that. And I respect him immensely as a creator, just less so as a person. Could this be enough for people to excuse a story past? Maybe if I just talked to Aaron, maybe I'd be able to see something in him I previously couldn't from afar. So I reached out for an interview, 
And he actually got back to me with a solid maybe, basically saying ask again later. So I said, sure, when is a good time for me to reach out again? And then he never responded. So actually the reason he cited for asking me to ask again later was the fact that he's actually moving all his stuff from the creative engineering warehouse to a new place. That warehouse has been his since the 80s, the beginning of the Rock of Fire. It's a lot of work to move everything there somewhere else. That building has such a deep history, it's strange to think it won't be where he spends his days anymore. This is the building that the Rock of Fire was born in. This is the building even the Wolfpack 5 was born in. This building has housed animatronics that haven't been used, haven't seen the light of day in 30 plus years. This building houses the Moon Rockers, never sold, left to sit and slowly decay. This building houses workstations of employees that haven't worked for CEI in decades. And as, as we lost people, well, the things that they did were no longer done and the tools that they used, they would just lay down. Like right here, this, this tool here has probably been sitting here for 20 years. You know, the guy that worked here at this desk and sat in this chair passed away more than 10 years ago. And he probably used this on his last day. And all of the pieces that are here, here these, these were his tools. So much of this warehouse hasn't been touched since the 80s or 90s. So much remains unchanged, and in a way, so does Aaron. He's returned to that warehouse regularly since the fall of the Rock of Fire, almost as if they never fell to begin with. To work on projects that never sold, never finished in time to sell, never finished at all. To sit amongst the 80s again. To sit amongst the 80s since the 80s. The creative engineering warehouse is a place stuck in time. It is a building unchanged, left to be forgotten by most. And now its sole inhabitant is stuck in time too a ghost drumming the hallways of the mess he created. Why did our infector just stop? Like, I mean no disrespect, but the dude seems to be frozen in time. I was wondering if anyone had any information on why I read the Wikipedia article, but didn't seem to talk about motive at all. His company was pretty much shut down in the late 80s, and he's still in that building, that old factory. I've seen a video of him talking about the company, and he still uses the present tense we, even though the only one still in the company is him, and I doubt he collects a paycheck. It's funny to hear you all speculate over my failures and changes in my life. Did you ever listen to John Lennon's song, Watching the Wheels? Do you think John was really just sitting there watching the wheels go round and round, or do you think he discovered something about life that younger people, or really anyone who had not traveled the world he traveled, understood? There's so much to unpack, but so much I don't wish to unpack. Success is a very personal thing. To some people, it is having the largest bank account. To someone else, it is having hundreds of people who work for you, making you feel like some kind of emperor. And to someone else, it may be having the absolute coolest shop to invent whatever you want to invent without a bunch of people moving your tools and stuff every time you go home. I am very strict about my no employees rule. I learned a big lesson. Having 325 grown children to babysit is not my cup of tea. It was a blessing for me when the showbiz project came to an end and I could say goodbye to all the constant employee issues that ate up my creative time. I will suggest to you all who speculate as to what I'm doing that you take a different viewpoint and realize that I am living my life the way I want to live it, not the way you think I should live it. I don't try to impress people with my wealth or pretend I have great wealth. Another lesson. All that does is attract the good hands people. Their hands are out, their respect for me and sincere, their needs between $2,000 and $10,000. So what do I treasure? My incredible shop that I own free and clear with all the equipment I was able to buy during the showbiz days, although I admit there are some dusty potentiometers. My financial stability that is provided by good financial planning despite setbacks such as blowing up my building and the real estate crash. I'm where I want to be or I would have done something else. I'm working on what I want to work on except when I'm giving tours, and I love to give tours because the people who come for the tours make me feel like I really matter to them and their children. I love producing my premium videos. They're sort of a diary for me. It's all right there. My goals, my dreams, my life, and none of you are apparently members because you don't know how great I'm doing and how happy I am. I can't believe I found such a beautiful lady to spend my life with and enjoy our gorgeous dogs with. And even though I blew up my patella tendon at the exact same time we were locked down due to COVID, in my typical style, I became the star of my physical therapy class, learning to walk again, learning to run again, and enjoying the challenges of my temporary handicap. So I'm 68 now and I expect to work another 60 years. My premium channel members will get to see how I do it and some of what I am working on. I have never been in a better position to enjoy life than I am right now. I really hate to brag about this and I don't mean to, but I just have a different way of measuring success than you guys who think my lifestyle is somehow less successful now than it was when I was being jerked around by the rat race. Good luck to you all. I hope you all find your own definition of success. Mine is going in that huge warehouse and finding all my experiments and projects right where I left them, ready to work on. And when I search for a screwdriver, finding it where I left it rather than where someone else left it. And I absolutely love not having to go to the IAAPA and beat the bushes for work just to keep hundreds of ungrateful mouths fed, many of whom were stealing me blind. Do you get it now? I'm the luckiest, healthiest, happiest man I know. And the reason I told you all this was because you seemed to be genuinely worried about me. Don't worry about my success. Worry about your own. 
Find success in your own lives. Make it real success, not something trivial like the kind of car you drive, or the size of the house you have to keep clean, or the appearance of wealth through debt. Have fun with your lives as I have had, and still have every single day. That is the true measure of success. Aaron Fector. And then a bot responds with a bunch of suicide hotline numbers. <laughs> Where does this leave us? Aaron being Aaron shouldn't stop you from liking his shows, if I've convinced you at all to do that in this video. In reality, he sort of only shows up every couple years in the public eye to once again proclaim himself as the guy who made showbiz pizza, remember that? AMA! Or maybe to make a tweet about how, I don't know, AI art is cool or something? He'd probably tweet that. But the good news about all this is that death of the author is still totally real. Just like he can change Eve of Destruction, you can change the Rock of Fire. Make Billy Bob gay if you want. What's he gonna do? He's literally just some guy. And Aaron, if you happen to be watching this video, which is actually pretty likely because I told you I was making it and also because you like to Google your own name so you can start arguments with 16 year olds on Twitter, don't bother commenting, okay? I'm not gonna give you any more attention because I know that's exactly what you want. You like the confrontation, you're like a grade school bully. But I know me saying that won't stop you, so I hope you'll at least take comfort in the idea that while I won't respond publicly, I will definitely screenshot your comment and laugh at you in private with my friends. <laughs> Grow up, man. Maybe use that energy you put into getting mad into actually working on second gen Duke for once. As for the rest of y'all watching, what should I leave y'all with? Well, despite how we all don't want it, it's an inevitability that places like Showbiz and Chuck E. Cheese are soon going the way of the dodo. I think we need places like this in the world. It seems our world is becoming more bland and bleak with each passing year. We need places of joy and fun and childlike whimsy in our lives. So go to a Chuck E. Cheese, preferably one with animatronics if you can. I'm serious, by the way. They've got free entry and they won't look at you weird if you're too old to be there, especially if you're with friends. Plus the pizza's really good. Just sit in front of the show for a while and maybe it'll brighten your day a little bit. That's all they were ever meant to do. I had someone tell me recently that they hoped Billy Bob's Wonderland would remove their stage before CEC 2.0 completed so that Chuck E. Cheese could outlast the Rock of Fire explosion. They were definitely joking, but that put a competitive spirit in me, suddenly very adamant that Billy Bob's would outlast them. It'd be poetic, I think, and if not, it'd at least be very funny. Whenever Aaron finishes moving out of his old warehouse, that building will be demolished. Every memory in that place will no longer have something physical to contain them. It's truly the end of an era, and maybe we can finally put this all behind us. Thanks for watching. Okay, here, see this circle? Stand, stand in this circle here. Okay, face the microphone and go ahead and say your story. We're having a birthday party. Today is a special one. Giving you one to grow on and it's just for you.